Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask uh, members of the public to take their seats, and if anyone would like to speak on any item, um, please uh, sign up at the clerk's table outside the, the chamber, and we'll start the meeting in one minute. On va commencer la réunion dans une minute. The meeting will be starting in one minute. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue uh, au Comité des finances et du développement économique en ce 3 décembre. Économique pour le 3 décembre. Welcome to the finance and uh, economic development on this 3rd décembre. Adoption de process verbaux pour le 5 novembre. Uh, confirmation of minutes of 5th November. A waiver required to add debenture report on the agenda. Councillor Tierney, please. Great. Um, whereas in accordance with the Finance and Economic Development Committee terms of reference, uh, um, has the authority to enact the debenture bylaws to authorize the issuance of the debentures with the project debt authority that's been approved by Council and the Treasurer has proceeded with one or more debt issues pursuant to Section 12.1, Section B of the Bylaw Number 2019-280, the Delegated Authority Bylaw, and whereas the Treasurer issued a 34-year debenture issue on November 25th, 2019, closing December 6, 2019. Therefore, it be resolved that FEDCO approve the additional item titled Bylaws that authorize a $120 million debenture issue for consideration at committee at committee today's meeting pursuant to section 89.3 of the procedural bylaw. On waiving the rules, carried. Uh, on the motion, Councillor Tierney, I think you have a question to the Treasurer. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, just real brief, uh, I've, I've looked at this. Um, where would some of this money be going? And it looks like a pretty good deal overall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor, it was a very good deal. This is uh, the lowest rate that the City of Ottawa has ever borrowed at. We're borrowing $120 million at a rate of 2.577% interest for 30 years. So uh, um, it was, again, uh, the moment that we uh, hit the screen to sell, it was completely sold out. So the City of Ottawa's good name in the financial markets uh, continues. And this, these monies will all be used to support uh, capital projects that would be funded from uh, tax dollars. That's uh, some good news. Thank you very much. Uh, on the motion, <coughs> carried. Uh, oh, okay. So, Count Councillor Meehan. Um, thank you. Um, what do we know, what's the overall cost of this to us over 30 years? I'll have to do the calculation, uh, Councillor, but uh, uh, 2.577 is almost the equivalent to what we can uh, uh, invest at these days. So it's, for us, it's not a very, um, uh, the cost to carry is very small, so. And what kind of, um, you said it's going to be supporting capital items on the budget. What kind of uh, capital items? There's a number of roads that this is uh, paying for. There's, uh, I don't believe there's any transit in this. There might be some uh, water and sewer works as well. So it's a variety of capital projects over, um, and typically that have all been built and that we're just funding now. And over what time period, uh, Ms. Similik? Sorry. This is a 30-year bond. So, they, but the capital projects that we're talking about, uh, what's the, the time frame of these capital projects? These projects would have all been approved in previous years and would already have been built. Okay, so we've approved the projects without having the money, so that's why we need the $120 million right now. 
we that's typically how we do it councillor we have enough cash flow that we actually don't have to go to the markets and get the money when you approve the project we can fund it internally and then when we think it's an appropriate time when our cash flow looks like it's decreasing we go to the markets and get the money anything else councillor i'm just wondering um what does this add to our debt our debt now will be at approximately, I think it's $2.6 billion, which, Councillor, when you consider that you have over $21 billion in assets that it's supporting, we're less than 10% of uh, the value of our uh, assets are funded by debt. And we can't sell those off, though, to pay down this debt, so um, this is just the... No, but it's... Okay. We're still using all of those assets. So you're just like you're using your home and you may have a mortgage on it, we're equivalent of having basically 10% of the, our mortgage uh, outstanding. Do we, is there a maximum debt that we are allowed to carry? Uh, yes. The province has uh, a limit of 25% of our own source funding. So according to their math, we probably could issue another $5 billion of debt before we would reach the, uh, the limit. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? On the, uh, the motion as presented by Councillor Tierney. Carried. Uh, Councillor Tierney, uh, uh, motion with respect to LRT. Which one's that? For, forgive me, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make sure I have the right one here. I just, which one? This one first, okay. Okay, keeping me in line here. Uh, bylaw number 2019-419, a bylaw of the City of, the, of Ottawa authorizing the borrowing upon uh, additional sinking fund debenture and the principal amount uh, of $120 million uh, towards certain capital works projects in the City of Ottawa. Guess I have to do that first. Carried. Adopt A. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tierney on uh, stage one and stage two of LRT, please. Just informed I have to do the confirmation of the bylaw that the following bylaws of the City of Ottawa be given three readings, enacted in Finance and Economic Development Committee in accordance with the delegated authority. A bylaw of the City of Ottawa to confirm the proceedings of the Finance and Economic Development Committee, a committee of council of the City of Ottawa. A meeting is held on December 3rd, 2019. Carried. Great. And LRT. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Therefore, be resolved that Finance and Economic Development Committee waive the rules of procedure to receive the presentations listed items 1 and 2 of FEDCO's agenda and pursuant to subsection 83.4a, dispense with the requirement for staff to provide a separate written report on these presentations. Motion carried. Okay, we'll just go through the consent agenda. Uh, Office of the Clerk, Bureau de Greffier Municipal, appointment to the heart of Office of the Clerk's Improvement Area, nomination au Conseil de Gestion de la Zone d'Amélioration Commerciale d'Orléans, appointment of André Grisella. Carried. A planning infrastructure and economic development, service de planification de l'infrastructure et de développement économique. <coughs> Item 4, light rail transit, stage 1, costs related to complete completed property acquisitions. Received. Item 5, Ottawa Stadium Lease, 300 Coventry Road, Location de Stade d'Ottawa, 300 Chemin Coventry. Carried. Item uh, 6, Planning Services, Service de la Planification, Brownfield Grant Program Application 716 and 770 Brookfield Road, Demande de Participation Programme de Subvention Pour la remise en valeur de friches industrielles 716 et 770 rue Brookfield. Carried. Item 7, Brownfield Grant Program Application 819 Bank Street, demand au titre de programme de subvention des friches industrielles 819 rue Bank. Carried. Uh, City Manager's Office, we have public delegation, so we'll come back to that. Uh, Finance uh, Department 2020 draft budget. We have items uh, and a presentation on that. 
And then we'll go back to uh, our first item on the agenda, item number one, stage one, LRT agreement update, mise à jour sur l'accord de projet relatif à l'étape uh, 1 de projet de TLR. Monsieur Manconi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the Commission of uh, uh, FEDCO. Uh, the two parts to this presentation, uh, the first I'll update you on uh, LRT stage one, the Confederation line from a uh, project agreement perspective, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Morgan who will give you an update on uh, stage two. So Mr. Mayor, uh, members of committee, progress is being made on, uh, on stabilizing the service uh, with the Confederation Line. Our priority continues to be on improving service for our customers and uh, we are in continuous uh, interaction with RTG and RTM to ensure that their focus is aligned with, uh, with making sure that we have consistent, reliable, safe service for our customers. Um, the four uh, main issues where uh, we are focusing with RTG is ensuring that they stay aligned on resolving uh, the issues that we've talked about in the past, which is the train control monitoring system, door operations, uh, the vehicle on board controller, and track switches. Uh, also, in terms of uh, ridership, because I know there's been some comments about uh, some of the disruption to our service, has that affected ridership? Uh, the data that we have so far indicates uh, September to September comparison from last year. We're at 3.7% uh, more ridership overall on the entire system. Uh, October, we're about 3.2% higher overall on the entire multimodal system. And for the 12-month period, uh, we're just under 1% increase uh, for the entire system also. So that uh, uh, is promising and hopefully that uh, continues. I'm now going to go through those four issues and give you an update in that regard. Uh, the number of occurrences uh, associated with the train control and monitoring system where it's causing disruption to the service, particularly in the AM and PM peaks, is trending downwards. Um, there, uh, there are a number of things we've done uh, with RTG, RTM and Alstom to, uh, to assist in this regard. Um, the first thing is there is software that's been deployed on all of the vehicles and that software does two things. It contains the issues that are generated by this uh, situation, so it minimizes the impact. And the second thing it does is it collects uh, critical data uh, which is passed on to the engineers and technicians that are looking at what's, uh, what the root cause could be and ultimately looking for a root cause solution. Um, a number of, in addition to that, we've implemented a, a bunch of measures that enable a very rapid response to reset the system. No different than resetting your computer at home. Uh, there's a procedure to that uh, when this TCMS issue arises. So that minimizes the disruption and, and when it does occur, in some cases, it's not even noticed uh, by anyone. Uh, and uh, although the root cause is not determined, uh, these combined measures have reduced both the number of incidences and the impact to service. And that international team of experts continues to be on the ground uh, assessing and looking for root cause. So from a, uh, a statistical perspective, the, this is a graph that demonstrates uh, the number of TCMS events that caused delay by week since we've launched. And um, you can tell we, in mid-October, towards the end, there, that's when we spiked and uh, things are trending downwards in terms of uh, the uh, occurrences, the number of occurrences, and the number of occurrences that are impacting services. So we're containing it and uh, we're continuing to work on uh, the permanent solution. In terms of door operations, um, again a reminder, a friendly reminder that you will always have doors interrupting service on any system around the world. Um, 50 to 60 percent of rail disruptions in, uh, in urban settings are associated with interactions with doors or doors going into default mode. That's normal that those are safety features kicking in. Uh, our door faults are being managed very, very well, so much so that it's also, it's virtually in, invisible in many, many cases to, uh, to service. Unfortunately, and please, I'm not blaming customers, I'm sharing information and we're going to be tweeting out very proactively. We had three delays last week where it was a direct result of customers forcing and prying open the doors. 
and we're going to uh, amp up our Twitter campaign. We're, we're putting additional signage in the vehicles. The customers need to leave the doors alone because especially when they force them open, uh, that can cause them to go into default mode and then there's a full reset that needs to occur with those doors. Um, we are uh, rolling out the, uh, the adjustments on the sensitivity uh, uh, associated with the doors. That's going to be worked on in the near future. Uh, we have a, a, a line of sight on how to do that. We are adjusting dwell times continuously and that's right down to seconds in terms of adjusting that so that there's ample time for people to board and exit the vehicle. Um, the, um, the impact of the severity of the door faults and how we manage them has significantly decreased in terms of impacts to the customers and to delays of service. So we, we've got this uh, in a good space. Uh, we need to continue to stay on top of RTG and RTM to make sure that they manage this accordingly and do those adjustments that uh, we've been looking for. And we're going to continue to enhance our communications out to the customers. So that's how it looks like from a, uh, from a uh, stats perspective. Um, it's, it's up and down all over the place. Uh, last week is, uh, you know, we would have been a lot less had we not had those three interruptions. Uh, and these are where the door events are causing a delay. Again, we're doing door isolation, which means the operator goes and isolates the door that's been interrupted, and we continue with service with minimal uh, impacts. That's literally down to minutes in terms of that operation. So there are occurrences uh, happening on the line. We're just uh, managing very well with our staff and with RTM staff. The uh, vehicle on board controller, that's the, uh, the TALIS controller system that uh, it's, it's like your GPS on your, uh, on your vehicle. Um, Fortunately, these are not major impacts on the main line. They're still occurring in the maintenance and storage facility. So when we're getting ready for deployment of trains and so forth, there's a direct link to the TCMS issue. So that working group, those engineers are, are correlating the uh, interplay between these two systems and making sure there's no issues. Very minimal impact out on the line. And as you can see by the data, um, the um, there's some uh, days, uh, weeks that uh, there's zero of them. Uh, there's a, we peaked at four occurrences in October, but again, uh, we're, we're trending in the right direction and it's being managed very well. So on the main line, uh, this is not a major contributor to interruptions to service. In terms of track switches, uh, as you know, we had a bad week about uh, 10 days ago where the track switch at uh, Blair uh, went into fault mode. Um, and unfortunately that was because RTM didn't have their guideway tech there like they were supposed to in the rush hour period. There's two switches that are very critical, Tunney's and Blair, and you, you've all ridden the system, that's when they do the crossover move. If those switches aren't uh, fully operable, they go into a fault mode and there's certain safety precautions we need to do. Um, we, we've had a frank discussion with uh, Peter Lausch those technicians that they committed to, to having them there for the AM and the PM peak need to be there. So the disruption that we saw about 10 days ago wouldn't have occurred if that technician was there on time and unfortunately uh, he or she wasn't. Uh, they're on top of that now, they're, uh, they're managing them well. We're seeing the technicians there for the AM and, and afternoon rush hour. Um, the switch covers that were a problem early on have been removed. Um, and they've, had, they've added extra resources uh, in the event of snow and ice. And all those switches have heaters, by the way, that are uh, monitored from our control center, so they're, uh, they melt the snow and ice. But as a precautionary measure, we've insisted that they have additional technicians and maintenance personnel if it rains, snows, or freezing rain uh, for those switches, because they are so critical. So in terms of that data, um, again, the week of the 17th into the 24th, uh, that, that would have been a flatter line had they had the technician in place um, at, uh, at uh, Blair Road. So what that means is when you look at it from an overall performance perspective, um, you're, you're looking for uh, zero on this graph is what you're striving for, which means your railroad operates at 100%. There's no railroad in the world that does that. Uh, this is the percentage of kilometers missed by week. 
And uh, you, you probably uh, can recall the spike of that 6%, which was the week of November 11th. That's when we had the track weld issue. We had to slow down train operations, which means fewer trips, which means congestion on the line and so forth. Um, but we, uh, you know, we did have, uh, we're in that 2%, which means you're operating at about 98% of uh, trips out there. That is very, very high. And I'm not at all dismissing the interruptions to our customers. I'm not minimizing that. Uh, I'm just sharing with you the data and uh, we are, uh, you know, as it's trending down to the bottom right, had that 6% not been there, uh, that's what we're uh, encouraging and forcing RTG to, uh, to focus on to, uh, to drive down those uh, uh, trips missed overall. So in terms of taking care of the customers, um, uh, we're enhancing services, uh, we're thinking outside the box in terms of what we can do uh, in the event of rail disruption. We have the 40 additional buses that we've deployed citywide, uh, which will get codified into the January schedule. Uh, those are yielding positive results. We have the 20 uh, dedicated R1 buses that we deployed yesterday uh, in the event of uh, rail disruption so that we don't have to bleed off of your routes. We have the additional 19 buses for your consideration in the budget. Uh, the O-Train ambassadors are being extended and we have the improvements to stations and trains that you've heard about, everything from strap hangers to, to weather protection and uh, platform changes and so forth. So the, the funding for service enhancements, this is the project agreement piece. Um, as we know, RTG has not fulfilled the contractual obligations. They are, they are required to deliver consistent, reliable service at very high standards uh, for, for our city. Uh, we are exercising our rights and there are many rights in the project agreement that are very straightforward and black and white. We have uh, expert legal advice, uh, both internal and external, guiding us every step of the way in terms of what we're entitled to do uh, in terms of managing this for our customers, for you, for our city. Um, we are deducting payments to the monthly service uh, payments based on uh, their performance and we're fully entitled to do that. It's not like we have to ask. That's an entitlement. It's clear in the project agreement. If they don't meet certain performance standards, we do uh, deductions. So those deductions are funding uh, a lot of the initiatives that we've been talking about. The project agreement also has various tools that we can take, undertake or um, use to ensure that the customer is protected, this taxpayer is protected, and we're invoking those rights. Um, we have uh, two specific mechanisms that we're, uh, we're rolling out immediately. The first is uh, conducting an operational review and the second is enhanced maintenance oversight. And what those means is we have the right to go in and look at any document, any contract, any matter uh, that we want to look at to, uh, to understand uh, their operation, any aspect of their operation. And what we're looking, what we are going to be looking for are gaps or concerns or things that need to be rectified and RTG has an obligation to meet its requirements under the PA. So those uh, gaps uh, which will be um, our issues, if they're identified by our experts, uh, we will bring them immediately to the attention of RTG and they have to bring forward a plan on how to identify, uh, address those issues. The second issue is enhanced oversight. And what that means is we get into their business and look at what they're doing and how they're doing it. With, uh, with uh, rail experts that we have that are at our disposal, we're looking for gaps, concerns. Uh, this is the, uh, the how are you doing things, how frequently, and I'll make it real for you. We can go in and we're going to ask, let's demonstrate to us your maintenance program on switches. How often are you inspecting them? Are you using the appropriate grease? There is different grease for winter operations and summer operations. What schedules do you have your technicians on? Uh, what's your resource deployment? Do you have all the proper tools and equipment for that? And uh, so we will be going in in certain areas very, very deeply to, uh, to ensure that we're comfortable to take, uh, to take the uh, necessary steps forward to identify those gaps and again under the, the project agreement they have obligations to meet and we'll be directing them to, uh, to, to address those issues in terms of correcting those things. 
So the next steps, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, is to uh, we're going to uh, Im immediately issue uh, our operational review team. We're going to also uh, put our experts uh, out in the in the field. We already have a level of oversight on the vehicle maintenance aspect. This goes deeper and goes across any area that we want to, uh, to review. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Morgan uh, for his presentation on stage two. I think we'll just hold, uh, I think we're going to do questions on stage one and then come back to stage two. Uh, I noticed uh, in Kitchener, Waterloo, there um, they had a snowstorm, ice storm, and the ice built up on the overhead wires and they shut the, system, the main system down. I think it's called the ION, I-O-N system. Uh, what are we doing to ensure that doesn't happen? We've been relatively fortunate. We haven't had much of a winter so far, which is good news, except unless you're a skater or a skier. But uh, we want to ensure we have overhead wires as well. How we ensure we don't uh, follow what happened in Kitchener-Waterloo? So we, we, have a, we have a winter plan for different various uh, winter conditions that RTM has filed with us. And on ice, uh, that, if that were to occur overnight in particular, uh, we would continue to run uh, limited service through the, the entire corridor uh, to, uh, to eliminate the ice buildup on the overhead catenary system. Thank you. Councillor Harder, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Manconi. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Councillor Hubley as well, who, as the chair of uh, the OC Transpo, I certainly appreciated, you know, from a political perspective, to have you as the point person and how hard you've been working on that. So thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Suds and I were just talking about the fact that we are noticing a decline in the number of people that are, are in the morning, in the afternoon, consistently, consistently talking about um, failure, what failure looks like, taking pictures, taking videos, etc. So that tells us that without a doubt we're trending the right way. I have a question on the, uh, on the track changes uh, slide that you had up there. You were talking about the technician didn't show up and so that was a... Would we not be able to have all this as programmable and would in today's time it be necessary to count on a person to actually activate that? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, so it's not about activating the switches. The switches are all automated. Uh, we've asked for, uh, because those switches are so critical and they had early um, failures associated with switch covers, we've, we asked to have technicians stationed there in the event of a failure of those switches or a problem with those switch. So when it happened seven, ten days ago, the switch didn't fully open automatically. You have to go there with the technician. The technician has a procedure to go there and check it and make sure it's, it's fine, Re, uh, reposition the switch and so forth. So it's a proactive measure. All the switches are automated. They function uh, with the CBTC system. That's great. Um, and another thing that I would say, if it's possible to focus um, messaging um, on, for example, the changes you're anticipating in January with the extra buses that come on, um, for example, the buses that will go from Tunney's to Canada, Eagleson, or Tunney's to, to Fallowfield are absolutely critical. And I, I know for a fact that people are hanging on by their fingernails to the, to, to the fact that it's only this number of days uh, left to do that. That's a game changer. That's a game changer for the people we represent, without question. Uh, when you think about the um, number of buses that are available to go in the direction to base or in the direction to baseline, to take 100,000 people and the riders of 100,000 people and more, because Stittsville is also uh, part of that, or in, in my case, 100,000 people, and, and including Councillor um, Means, part of Barhaven. Um, you take that number of people and to have them on a, a Pony Express is not realistic because too many people who don't need to go to Fallowfield, don't need to go to Eagleson, are getting on anything that they want. So my point on the messaging is it's confusing because we did have a bus that was jumping and going from Tunney's to Fallowfield and that seemed to be working well and you had one as well. But um, like yesterday I had from somebody saying, I thought all the buses were going, are the 270 series supposed to stop at baseline? Okay, now we stopped at Majestic. The bus number is, X, you know, four letters. Sportsplex 2, seriously? And, and, and so, the, so that kind of stuff, 
I think it's really important. What should they be expecting? At perfect, perfect scenario, what should they be expecting? Because that's what they're hoping for. Like that's what they're waiting for. And I think that that will, you know, bias continued support of our, our service and uh, and make it more reliable. Uh, Councillor, I agree with you 100%. And we are going to be giving uh, all of you a very precise. Uh, scripted memo on what the changes are by routes so that you'll have that well in advance and then our comm strategy is to push out exactly what you're talking about because with the 40 bus for, excuse me with the 40 buses a lot of them were filling in gaps and so there is some of that confusion out there that was a, a calculated risk that we took because we wanted to provide the service rather than miss a trip uh, we are going to do you know if I could call it that resetting or that clarification as to what routes specifically go where, and I know many other councillors have asked me, when do I know the exact changes for January? It's coming, there's a whole team working on that, and uh, I agree with your point, it has to be crystal clear to everybody, uh, both f to your offices, to the customers, on our website, social media, and so forth. And we're sequencing all that because we've got other messages that we have to communicate out, like we're gonna go to manual door operations for winter, we're worried about information overload, and, and uh, so it's, Deliver great service, get the communication part right, all in parallel, and try to do it all uh, all together. And I think you can count on each of us to individually know how to get that information out to the people that we serve best. And then you don't worry about that. I mean, you're going to come up with a package that fits the whole system. But really, whether it's Councillor McKenney or Councillor Brockington, myself, Councillor Kavanaugh, uh, Councillor uh, Dudas, individually. I think it's the best way of getting the information out and the people having the confidence in that and understanding that, okay, so this is about Barhaven. I'm not going to be telling them about Orleans Ward. I'm not going to be telling them about West Carleton. If they want to go there, they can find out that information. But I think that just to make it really easy, do the best you can at giving us the, 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 the wordsmithing that we can actually just pound away at it so people, even in the busy time of Christmas, can actually catch on to the fact that, okay, that's great. I, well, babe, by the time I come back from my Christmas holidays or my uh, whatever I, I'm doing or we were away skiing or whatever, I know that this is gonna happen for me. And I think that would be go a long way. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor McKenney, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for the uh, for the update um, and the uh, the more regular updates that we've been getting. It uh, certainly has been helpful in in terms of responding to um, uh, some of the inquiries that we're getting into our office. So I thank you for that as well. Just want to ask about the number of drivers and the training uh, between now and January. Uh, how many drivers, how many new drivers are you having to bring on and how is that training happening in what seems like a, a shortened period? So we just uh, screened, I believe, because we had to book Tom Brown Arena, 160 operators. Uh, they're going through the, uh, the process. Remembering, I think our failure rate's 20 to 30 percent on that. Uh, so we're definitely over the 100 mark in terms of what we're trying to, uh, to lock down. Um, we put together an integrated team of HR, ourselves, uh, and others, MTO. And uh, we, we're working, we've never done this before actually. We, we're going through the weekends. We're actually looking at split ships for training and so forth. Uh, we, we know we have enough resources to go with everything that's been put before you, which is the 40 buses, the 19 new buses in service, and the 20 on um, the replacement service. What we need to do is build up what's called the spare board, which is in the event someone calls in sick or we're short on operators and so forth. So that's what we're pushing towards right now. And um, we have trainers, uh, we're even looking at bringing back trainers that have retired and uh, get them recertified to help us out. We've reached out to other agencies. Uh, they're offering us training uh, trainers in January. So our goal is to bring, uh, I'd say, over 100 operators back. I guess I, I'm thinking more about timing. What is a normal time frame for training a new driver? So let's say I apply to be a driver, uh, you bring me in, I make it through that 70%. 
what is the what is the normal time frame for for training me to actually go out there and turn on that key and and start to you know um, move passengers around? There's a number of things. I believe off the top, the MTO uh, uh, days is 36. And so it's around six weeks start to finish, but that's just using a conventional uh, training regime of eight hours and so forth and not looking to, you can do uh, road and you can do in classroom. And again, the team is looking at how we, uh, we condense, condense that timeline if we can. So historically, we've always trained our drivers in about six weeks. And that's what we're looking at doing between now and January, is that correct? No, Councillor, it's, it's, it's varied. Uh, we've been, uh, we comply with all the MTO rules on training. Uh, we've been audited. Uh, as you know, we went through a bus crash, uh, two of them. We've, uh, we've had investigators in on looking at a lot. So I'm, I'm not sure where you're going in terms of what you're looking for in terms of the training, but... I just want to know how we're going to have enough drivers trained for January. I'm just not sure how that, what that looks like. So you're running the service right now with all of your service plus the 40 plus the, uh, the 20 on standby. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 19 buses that uh, we, uh, we have to uh, service. We have enough operators right now to do that. Uh, the challenge is we've got moves within the organization of backfilling some para operators, mechanics and operators. So that's what we're doing now to the end of January. Okay, thank you. Um, just switching back over to uh, stage one and I, um, I live very close actually to both uh, Confed and Trillium line and um, you know I, I think about Trillium line often now because it, it does work so well and we operate it and maintain it ourselves um, and I just wonder what the uh, overall performance say in the last I don't know year, two years, three years has been for the Trillium line. Actually correction counselor we don't maintain that ourselves. Okay. We just operate it. We operate it? Yeah. Okay. It, the maintenance of the vehicles is contracted out. The tracks are contracted out. The switches are contracted out. The communications is all contracted out. Okay. And the performance of that, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. It's, uh, it's around 98, 99 percent, 98 and a half, 99. Uh, it's very, very high. But I will remind you of the launch of that because I know I was sitting there with the former chair. It uh, was a very, very rough start. And we went through uh, many months of trials and tribulations with switches and all sorts of things too in terms of uh, typical ramp ups. But uh, yeah, Trillium line is a great performing uh, line. It's stabilized, it went through its teething pains and uh, it's, it's a, we operate it and the, sur the maintenance is contracted out. Okay, sorry, I, I, I was mistaken there. Um, and you mentioned uh, last meeting uh, that we're to expect track heaving on the Confederation line. Um, and again, I go back to the Trillium, and I know we can't make a direct comparison, but, uh, but my understanding is that the, the tracks are similar. Tracks are tracks, right? We've been laying tracks in this country for a long time. So I, I just wonder, like, have there been track heaves and, 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 and weld cracks on the, the Trillium line? So I, I'll say one thing and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Morgan who knows this uh, like the back of his hand. A track is not a track is not a track. There's different gauges, there's different widths, there's different heaters. So on Trillium line you've got gas heaters, on the Confed line we have electric heaters. But uh, I know that uh, there was inquiries about comparing the, uh, the heaving and the track welds on Confed to Trillium. I'll, I'll get Mr. Morgan to comment on that. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, we, you know, at Trillium Line, Carlton in particular, the passing siding at that location, uh, we had the original spring switches that were installed uh, in 2001, and those those switches for a number of years, uh, due to fouling of the ballast and other issues, did did suffer from heaving, and that's why that particular location. Well, that's why for a little while. Uh, we were having problems on the Trillium line. We did, uh, through some PTIF funding, we were able to replace those, uh, you know, replace all the ballast, so clean ballast. So the heaving issue at that location has been corrected. Um, in terms of, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Trillium line first and then go to the Confed. In terms of the track, the track is continuously welded rail. It was replaced a number of years ago when the pilot first opened. They, they used the, uh, the original rail, which was bolted. Um, that was swapped out to continuously welded rail. Um, which needs to be installed and set at the correct temperature. 
Um, otherwise, you do suffer from you know sun kinks in the summer, which we do see on the uh, uh, on the Trillium line. There is a problem uh, in a couple of locations where in high heat waves we slow the track down. Um, you know, we've been fortunate that we haven't, in the opposite, in the winter months, we haven't seen any rail breaks uh, on that track. And so it's really a question of uh, mitigating the summer performance. So, the, so that's the Trillium line. The difference on the Confederation line, we have a number of tight curves um, that uh, you know, are essentially brand new rail. Uh, RTG is working to get essentially the neutral temperature, finding the balance between how to set up the rail for the cold winters and the hot summers in order to minimize the potential for a rail break or to minimize in winter or to minimize the potential for kinking or, or shifting a rail uh, in the summer due to the high temperatures. Um, those tight curves near Herdman are, you know, they are seeing some challenges at those locations. They, they did take some rail out, they did put some rail back in, and then unfortunately a few weeks ago one of the, um, one of the welds did break. Now the system is designed to minimize the gap that's created when a, a weld fails so that you don't have a safety incident. Um, that same type of setup, the, the advanced clips, uh, minimizing the, the track movement, we don't have on the Trillium line. So you have a very good fastening system on the Confederation line. We just need to kind of get through this period of stabilizing the rail, making sure that RTG sets up the rail for the correct temperature that deals with both the hot summer months and the cold winter months. Okay, I, I can appreciate that, but I just wonder then um, why that wasn't done when it was built. Why? So if I, and I'm not sure that I, I fully understand you, but what you're saying is you may have to take it out, you may have to reinstall, there's a, a perfect temperature at which it, it, it allows for expansion, is that, is that correct? Counts are all rail. But, but I guess I wonder why that wasn't done by RTG to begin with, like why didn't they put it in at the perfect temperature? No, they did, Counselor. The analogy is this, just like a new house, when you move in, after the first year, you have some nail pops and drywall cracking, settlement of the house and so forth. All rail lines that go through extreme temperatures heat and contract. And the operations that we're doing, so last summer, unbeknownst to yourselves, they actually had to go in and cut a rail. They just cut it and that releases the tension and the rail sets right back and they re-weld it. This is done across the world where there's differential in temperatures. RTG did what they needed to do and what happened the other day and the term rail break sounds so catastrophic, it's not. There's a whole safety protocol associated with it and so forth. And what occurred there has happened everywhere around the world and there's a response to it and they did a very good job responding to it. And we will, I'll tell you right now, this spring we're going to have track heaving and we're going to issue slow orders. We do it all the time on Trillium. This happens everywhere. We need, to, we need to get into this cadence and this, this normalization of railroad operations. The system has to find its equilibrium and go through four seasons of adjustments. Ballast will heave, settle and so forth, just like a new road, just like your house does. So on the rail track, I'm not trying to minimize it, Councillor, this is all normal stuff. So the Trillium line has had track heaves? Yes. And we all expect to see that? again this spring? On Trillium? Yeah. You could. Okay. Depends on the temperature. There's jurisdictions that actually take fire hoses out and, and cool the, the track down to get it to, to come down. And then when you do the repair, you have to wait till the middle of the night to bring the track down to a certain temperature so that the weld can adhere and so forth. So when we did that adjustment on the, on the track last summer, it was in the middle of the night. It has to reach a certain temperature. There's a science to continuous weld rail. Okay. Um, just got, coming back to um, your go forward plan, um, you said that you had a team of experts that you were going to do enhanced oversight uh, and an operational review. So are those experts in-house today or are they the experts that you brought in from externally, that, the names that were given to uh, Councillor Meehan? Some of those names on that list and they were propping that up with other experts also. And then we bring in specialized people like again on the, uh, the track issue that I talked about last summer, we brought in an expert on track from Chicago. Uh, he's probably the best in North America that understands just track geometry and track uh, heaving and uh, welding processes. So depending on what we find on the review, 
we'll start to bring people in and we have a long roster of experts that have run, maintained, built and managed railroads. So, so that's for the operational review but then the, the enhanced oversight, like who will be the rail experts to do our enhanced oversight and how long will they be with us? Like what, does, what will that look like? What's the confidence that we have going forward? So we, we currently have two full-time people at the MSF that uh, rotate through there every single day, seven days a week. They're looking at vehicle issues. On top of them, we're going to have an operational person that looks at operational movements in the yard, deployment and so forth. On top of that, for two months, I have uh, probably one of the leading uh, rail maintainers uh, for maintenance in North America. He worked in uh, former New York City. Uh, and uh, he'll be here for the month of December and January. And on top of all of those folks, I have uh, probably one of the best uh, individuals in, in North America that uh, currently works with STV that was on the list of, uh, that we provided to Councillor Meehan, um, who's bought more rail cars in North America than anybody else, has run the busiest system in North America, and uh, knows CBTC, and the list goes on and on. We can bring in experts. So if we have a CBTC issue, Michael knows a CBTC expert that's on call and so forth. And, and RTG will pay for that? That's I, correct. I imagine they don't come for cheap. They, uh, no, you've got to pay for the right talent. And uh, yeah, RTG will pay for that. And just uh, one last question then. You just mentioned, and maybe it's more of a comment, that RTM uh, didn't have the, te the technicians to deal with the, uh, the switches at the uh, terminus stations. What was there? Did they give a reason for not showing up for work that day? It seems to me we're paying them an awful lot of money and all eyes are on the system right now. Um, why would they not come out to pull those trains out of the, the terminus station? So apparently the guideway technician was en route. I don't know if he or she got delayed. They weren't there. They need to be there for 3.30 to 6.30 is, uh, is the period that uh, they're supposed to be there. And I can assure you that Mr. Lausch, he spoke to myself, Mr. Kanalakis, and even the mayor that day. And the trains, how are they? So, so when this technician shows up, what are they, they're just overseeing the trains, they automatically come out, like what does this, what does this technician do when they are at the terminus station? I'm just not clear on that. So there's multiple technicians. We, they have technicians out on the vehicles. They have rover technicians. They can do anything, doors, they can uh, help the uh, operator reset the uh, TCMS failure and so forth. The technician at Tunney's and Blair for the switches, they're what's called guideway technician. They're rail experts, like actual track. And that's if the switch goes into default or there's anything associated with the switch. So we have those people at the terminus stations. We have rovers throughout the system to respond to vehicle issues. And then they have more senior, um, vehicle technicians on vehicles moving around so they can get to other locations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tierney. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, uh, I do want to thank uh, John and your team. Uh, I think it was the last Transit Commission meeting. I brought up the fact that Searville Station was one of the only ones that doesn't actually have a bus going to it. Uh, and then, of course, we saw a lot of the images from our riders that had to, you know, traipse through the snow, 800 meters down, Searville, up Cummings. It was quite a, quite a stretch. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for acting so fast. As of, I believe, yesterday, and please confirm this, instead of making that long, you know, pilgrimage to a bus stop, uh, you can actually catch that R1 service right in front of Searville Station now. That's correct. And, and second, after uh, I had made mention of that, I thought, well, we have a situation with platform crush at Blair, and any time we can reduce those numbers, that'd be great. And Councillor Dudas came over to me immediately after I mentioned, yeah, maybe there's some in the Orleans area, the Navin area we can look at. She came over, and we've been collaborating since. I did want to thank you, and Pat, uh, we've been meeting uh, very intensely over the last little while uh, about some opportunities over the next few months that could alleviate some of that uh, platform crush and, and modify some of the routes from that area. Um, but of course, uh, just we would want to consult with, with the public first. So I did want to thank you for that. Um, I did have a question about um, this, these students. I think, I think we have a really good opportunity here and we're going to get a little bit of relief because students put a tremendous amount. We love our students riding our, our trains. They're going to put a lot of pressure on the trains and they do put a lot of pressure on the trains. 
But as they head into exam period, the next three to four weeks uh, with holiday season and uh, lack of students, I, I think we have a really good opportunity, or RTG will have a good opportunity to try to get a lot of this right. I just want to make sure that first of all, um, RTG, are they going to go hard on this? Are they going to actually have everybody there? There won't be a lot of people taking Christmas holidays, which people are entitled to, but that's a, their problem. They've got to figure that out. And, and second, will we be looking at maintaining a, a, a maximum train set? So not, not to go, okay, well, there's no students. Obviously, it's the holiday season. The trains are reducing. I, I think that would be a poor way to go. I think they should go full steam ahead. And I want to ensure that we're testing like we're in a full... Uh, full rush hour all the time until we get back after the holidays and hopefully they'll have resolved a lot of those issues. Uh, Councillor, on the train set, uh, absolutely I can guarantee you we're not uh, reducing the train uh, count volume. I hope ridership continues to be busy and I hope people use uh, transit and rail to go do their shopping at our great malls that are directly located uh, along the line and so forth. Uh, and then we've got New Year's Eve that we want to promote and so forth and Christmas festivities and so forth. So we're going to keep the uh, train sets at the volume that they are at. Um, I think there's some reduction of schedule hours like we do with bus and service. Uh, I don't know the exact changes there. On resource level, I will give credit when credit is due. Uh, Alstom has significantly increased resources on the ground for vehicle maintenance and, and uh, warranty and so forth, uh, as has RTG through their RTM uh, arm. Um, we met with Mr. Lausch yesterday, he walked us through the, uh, uh, the number of resources that they're at, they have added, uh, and that's a very positive sign and they're, they're definitely listening to us. And again, I know it's difficult for some people, it's in their best interest to get this right, because that gets them the money. Completely agree. And on money, since you brought it up, uh, just to reiterate the extra buses, uh, the red vesters, these are all coming from their side of the fence and not our side? That's correct. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Tierney. Uh, Councillor Brockington, uh, just a reminder for the people who are here to speak for the budget, uh, apologize, but we have a number of people that want to uh, deal with this issue. So. Um, it will be some time because we have, I think, uh, eight people. So if you're here to speak to term of council priorities or the budget, uh, it'll be a little bit uh, longer. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and good morning to everyone. Uh, Mr. Manconi, thank you for the update. Um, good to see progress and good work. Um, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about right now? I want our customers happy, all of them. And they've been through a lot. And I'm concerned about our operators and our staff, all of them at OC Transpo. There's a direct correlation between the two. The whole team's been working hard for our customers, and our customers want consistent, reliable service. That's what keeps me up at night. Do you share with your team, your employees, who are putting in 110%, the same types of updates you give council? Do you give them the progress updates, let them know that there is progress, that their work is helping to achieve these, these objectives? Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you just confirm either yourself or the city treasurer that all costs associated with the technical issues that we're having, all the expertise, all the extra work, all the labor costs, everything is covered as per the deductions we're making from our maintenance payments? The uh, extra costs will be covered either from the deductions that we're making or from uh, the exercising of the clauses within the project agreement that allow us to recoup them from RTG. So quarterly updates in 2020 from OC Transpo, end of the year 2020, we are not expecting to see budget overruns because of these particular additional costs. Uh, you should not see overruns. My caution to you is this. You have built a significant amount of redundancy into the system. When the system is operating as it should under the project agreement, you will no longer be able to charge those costs to RTG, and Council will have to decide at that point to eliminate the redundancy. If you don't eliminate the redundancy, you will have overruns in your budget. Right. Okay. Very good. Very good there. Just going back to the doors. Um, I think we have to differentiate between expected human behavior that's going to happen 
no matter how many tweets go out, no matter all the campaigns that we do, there's just certain behaviors that humans will engage in regardless of what jurisdiction you're in. I'm on the TTC once a month. When I'm down there, I'm on the subway. I see it all the time. But their door has the ability to almost adjust itself, right? Not all the doors have to reopen. It's whatever door has some sort of blockage can do that. So will we eventually get our doors to the point where they'll be able to recognize that type of interference, readjust itself? Uh, yes, uh, we, we currently have three resets. So the door, depending on the force that you apply to it, cycles three times. The sensitivity uh, adjustment calibration is the piece we need to, uh, to concentrate on and we're just starting to roll that plan out. And can you confirm, I think there were stickers at least mentioned or maybe they were put on and they came off, but I think maybe the most effective public outreach campaign would actually physically put a sticker on each door that basically has maybe, you know, a red line circle, red line through it that basically says do not pry or do not adjust, something like that. So it's in your face, it's right on the door, I'm about to do it, oops, oh yes, I shouldn't be touching this. Has that been considered? That's what we're going to roll out. Uh, okay. I know, Councillor, you're on the Trillium line quite often. I think we have that exact uh, okay. sticker there, and we're going to do that. Um, okay. Are we adjusting how we're going to manage LRT phase two based on lessons learned from phase one? What have you changed with the entire phase two process based on our experience so far since LRT rolled out? I'll let uh, Mr. Morgan uh, speak to that. Okay. So I think one of the biggest changes is really the proving period right now with the vehicles. Um, you know, all of these changes, uh, whether it be, you know, simple changes like the strap hangers or software modifications, the TCMS software changes that uh, will ultimately be uh, resolved by Alstom, all of those changes get wrapped up into the vehicle fleet, the next 38 vehicles that we've purchased for stage two, such that by the time we get to stage two, uh, we'll essentially be going into a testing commissioning period, a trial running period with a set of proven vehicles. Uh, you know, so we're using this period to work out all of those bugs uh, with the vehicles. At the same time, we're taking a hard look at any changes, uh, any, you know, capacity issues that we're seeing at the stations or any, any things with the, any characteristics of the stations that we're not happy with. We're looking at how do we roll those changes into the designs for stage two. Good. I've got a number of questions related to phase two, which I'll just hold because um, I want to make sure that if there is an opportunity to learn from station design, carriage design, senior management oversight, testing, that we bring that over to phase two so that in three, four years, no, we're not having the same type of conversation here. But again, I appreciate the update. Thank you. Can Councillor Menard, please. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, thanks for the presentation this morning. Um, we held a public meeting uh, on transit issues about three days ago. And uh, we had a lot of, lot of people show up. Um, the public remains concerned about not just uh, stage one rollout, but, but the transit issues on the buses as well. Um, and so they talked extensively about some of the areas that they're experiencing issues around missed bus trips and some scheduling problems. Um, the LRT launched. They have, they have a lot of potential solutions as well, though. They talked a lot about... Um, you know, reducing the um, tie-ups at Blair and Tunney's, uh, ways to spread out bus distribution and scheduling to alleviate backups with the R1 service, uh, not just at those two areas, but uh, in between. They had suggestions from sort of tech pros there on, on the apps and, and why the apps aren't, aren't working pro appropriately and what we can do to enhance the OC Transpo um, apps. Talked about shelter suggestions, scheduling su suggestions, direct from some operators as well who, 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 uh, who have concerns and have ideas about how to fix these issues. And so I think there's a, there's a really cheap and easy win here. And it, it involves creating a, a community consultation group with average riders who have been experiencing these issues and have some solutions or suggestions for you. And it doesn't cost us any money. It's a good public thing to do as well because you can take the issues from a, 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 
a subset of people that would represent the majority from all regions of Ottawa and, and work with them, bring in average riser, riders. So I guess the question is, would you consider forming a, that type of a community consultation group um, during this critical period and, and bring in some of those average riders who have some of these suggestions? You, you really could benefit, I think, from this and the, the system as a whole would, would be helped uh, from all areas of Ottawa. So is, is that potential on your radar if, if that is a suggestion from council and committee? Councillor, uh, we already have that and you know, I, I saw some of the comments from that meeting that OC Transpo doesn't listen to its customers. Uh, in the majority of the changes of the 40 buses came from your offices and customers and we rolled out a portal on updates. You know, I, I'm hearing we're not informing people. There's a live daily updated portal and we tell people to send us their suggestions and you're assuming that we're not listening to the customers and not taking their ideas and suggestions into account? I'm sorry, I have to be very blunt on this. It's the opposite. We're in the customer service business. I just got asked what keeps me up at night. It's the customers. We have 3,000 dedicated employees in that department who live and breathe on one thing, the customer. And we do listen to them and, and the customer gets upset when we have to unfortunately say no. You know, I, I've talked to many customers, that, well just put more buses out there and more, well that's about taxes, that's about costs, that's about managing the bottom line. And so you're assuming we're not listening to customers, we have that. We have a transit commission and we have very accessible staff and we do ward meetings and we go and listen and we solve problems. We just solved literally overnight Councillor Tierney's issue. That was one email from customers that went to him and said, we have a problem with this, would you consider that? And a team quickly mobilized. So do I have time to set up another process to do public consultation citywide to hear ideas from customers? It already exists. But if council wants to direct us to establish a citywide process for listening and soliciting ideas, I'll take that direction from Council. So just, uh, I just want to clarify because I, I feel it's a bit defensive here and I'm, I'm trying to offer a, suggu a suggestion that would I think help. And so uh, with my office there's been some good dialogue, Pat Scrimger and others and we've solved some issues together uh, and you've been helpful in that in me communicating some of the things that I'm hearing. But I get a lot, I get a lot of email about this issue, a lot of other suggestions that come in and it is uh, I think prudent to look at other options that exist out there to both do good PR and communicate with your riders who are critical and bring them in on the information that's necessary. So are you saying that the group that already exists is, is Transit Commission? Is that what you're saying or? No, I'm saying that I communicated to all of you that there's a portal that gives updates and also says tell us every single idea from anybody citywide and we have a whole team that tracks every single idea and suggestion and implements that including the 100, in 100 inquiries that we had from council in one month on ideas and suggestions that came from your residents. Okay, well, just, just to say, I, I'm not getting that back. Uh, we're hearing regularly from people that they send emails in, they're not being responded to over a long period of time. We have very simple route suggestions that have come in that have been very difficult since this changeover has happened uh, to see progress on or get a response on. And the people that are talking about things like shelters and minor adjustments, if you bring them in during this time, it will be seen as a win and it is a cheap win. <laughs> and I, I, I guess I'm asking you, if you're open to that consideration, maybe we can have the discussion at uh, a commission. But it, you know, the feedback we're getting and that I hear from my colleagues as well, it's, it's not that they're well informed <laughs> on these issues. It's not that they have been responded to by OC Transpo. It's not that they're feeling like they're being included in these solutions around paratranspo and other other areas, they don't feel that way. The majority of customers uh, that I've talked to do not feel that that is the case right now. So this is a simple solution. I don't want it to be a defensive thing. I really think you could benefit from, from doing this. So I'll, I'll try to work with you and, and, uh, and see if we can't get something like this started um, in a way that will be productive for, uh, for all of us. Um, in terms of the stage one uh, maintenance con I just want to be clear on this. Th there's a four to five million dollar payment per month, right? And so can you tell me uh, why does that vary? Why is it four or five or in between? What's the variance? 
It's, it starts off just over $4 million at the beginning of the 30-year concession, and as you move through, and, and the Treasurer can explain, there's debt repayment and so forth, it, it, it peaks out around, I believe, $5 million. So it's over the journey of the 30 years. And that's not just for maintenance? This is for other capital costs, or is that just for maintenance? No, that's the 30-year concession period, and Marion can give you the highlights on that. There's a number of factors that go into that payment. The largest part I think is actually the maintenance and that's determined by the number of hours that are uh, or kilometers that are driven, number of service hours, etc. Then there's also the repayment of the, uh, the debt and equity that RTG put into the project. They get repaid that over the next 30 years. And there's also some uh, SVP, special purpose vehicle costs, which is part of what we had to do to set up this arrangement. And there's insurance that gets uh, they take out insurance, we repay them. So there's a number of factors that go into that payment every month, which is why it varies slightly okay, from month what to is, month. What is the, the maintenance-specific cost then? You said that's the majority of it. What is that? I believe the maintenance cost is roughly uh, $2.6 million. Okay. $2.6 million per, per month. Okay. Um, and then... We've heard um, some of the issues are reducing. At what point are we able to add that additional train that we've talked about? Do you, do you, have, you said once these issues are sort of getting close to being resolved, do you anticipate that by the end of the year? What is your new timeline on that? So RTG is looking at adding two double trains, what you have right now, uh, hopefully by the end of January. They don't have the exact timing. What you're going to see shortly are uh, the, those trains out on the line being tested off peak service with big yellow signs on them with the doors opening and closing but you can't get on them and so forth. Um, the balancing act that they're doing is a lot of the track time that's available for that testing right now is being utilized for the TCMS debugging. So they want to get the TCMS rectified and then they can do the testing and commissioning of those two new double trains. If they get those in line soon, then the 14th train can be launched because they'll have appropriate counts and, and they won't have TCMS issues bogging them down. So it's tied in with the TCMS issues. It's not that we don't have the vehicles. It's about stability on the fleet and having consistent uh, reliability out there. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, my last question on the stage one piece is on, on that 30-year uh, maintenance deal, can that be amended or changed in the contract? Um, is there a different maintenance group that we could eventually select. Uh, if there is a possibility of amendment or changing, what is the financial penalty associated with that um, in terms of the one group? You have a long list of tools to do many things uh, when they're not performing. And that is a wide range of the actions we're taking right now. Uh, the, you can go in and replace portions of the organization. You can replace the entire organization. Uh, you're also the, the lender. You can do things that way. Uh, you have um, what some have characterized as the best P3 construct in Canada in terms of the tools at your disposal to protect the taxpayer. Okay. So w hey, is Councilor, there a penalty your time to is up. Uh, oh, okay. Your time is up. Thank you. Councillor okay, Cloutier, you. please. Merci, Monsieur le maire. Uh, merci. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Manconi and Mr. Morgan, for your update. Thank you to Councilor Menard. He asked the question with respect to trains 14 and 15, and thank you for that information. It's, it's important because <clears throat> riders of the LRT know how, how busy it is, certainly at the, at the very peaks. Um, and, and we are happy that ridership is up, but uh, it, is, it is very busy. And so the sooner those trains can, can get on the track, uh, the better it is. Uh, we've spoken about a lot of issues and, and uh, communication and the R1 buses, the availability of those uh, when the LRT is disrupted, safety and, and the, the connectivity of the regular bus service. But I wanted to focus on the, um, the LRT itself and reducing the instances of uh, door issues and, uh, and um, um, train, uh, computer-based train control and the VOBC. Can you speak to us about, and, and, and you told us about the technicians that are being uh, positioned a little bit better and the knowledge that OC Transpo and RTG are gaining from 
uh, using the system, from uh, operating the system and the information for our passengers. I'd like to see data, if possible, with respect to the amount of time it takes to reset a door. The, the resources are there. Is the amount of time to reset a door going down? Because I think that, as you have said, it will always happen door or mechanical or, or uh, a computer VOBC, um, computer-based train control issue will happen. The, the, the quality of our service will be in how quickly we can reset those issues. Any comments that you could provide on that? No, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Councillor. So doors, three to five minutes, if it's a isolation, so that the operator has to get out of their cab, depending how crowded the, the train is, work their way to the door, and if it's the last door, it takes longer, hence the range. And uh, there's a, uh, a door isolation process, so they can lock that door down and then continue the train in service. So get out of the vehicle, go to the door, use the special key, r lock down the door, go back to the vehicle and start again. So we're doing that in under five minutes on the fly right now. And is there not a technician? I have seen Alstrom technicians on board the train. Are they not there to assist with that? Yes, they can, they can also assist if there's a technician on that train or in that, you know, on the first car or the second car, they'll quickly uh, mobilize and go and do that. They all have radio communication with each other. Okay. So that gets it even quicker. What about with the um, communication issue, computer-based train control, the VOBCs, and when that, you have said that it happens, uh, I, I believe you've said it happens more at uh, Tunney's or at Blair, but of course it has an impact on the entire system. How quickly are those issues resolved to keep the train going? So the VOBC, uh, like I said, it's rarely happening on the main line. Uh, the TCMS failures or, or code fault uh, happens predominantly at Blair, sometimes at Tunney's, and rarely along the main line, so that's a good thing. Um, and what we did there, it's literally minutes because what we do is at uh, those terminus stations is we have the operator on one end of the cab, we have a technician that immediately goes into the other cab, and so the operator resets first, if it's not on that vehicle, the technician resets it on the other cab so uh, they don't have to walk down and, and, and do it. So it's, it's a double cab entry immediately at Blair and Tunney's. So in the event that there's a TCMS issue, so it's a proactive move, that's got us down into minutes also. So, so by the time though that train is loaded up, it's, it's good to go. So we haven't been seeing those issues so much on the line between Tunney's and Blair that's correct. Between Chinese and Blair uh, since, uh, since we've launched in, in early October. There, there's been uh, one instance uh, on a few of the stations, and I think Bayview uh, twice. Okay. With respect to the door and providing information to our customers and uh, making sure that people know about the doors, you had, and Councillor Brockington talked about it a little bit, stickers on the doors. I, I believe you were going to put some hangers on the train, is that? Uh, the, that the strap hangers are going in? No, not the strap hangers, information hangers with respect to the doors. Yes, I believe that's part of it also. That's that and backpacks also, because we're having backpacks hitting the doors and so forth, so it's just an awareness program. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Merci, Concier, Councillor Blay, please. Uh, Councillor Blay. Uh, just to, to tap into, I think, questions that Councillor Menard was asking, um, you had said that some new vehicles are coming in, or going to be, begin testing in, in the new year. Uh, so to confirm, those are vehicles 14 and 15? No, we, we have 14 and 15. Those, those are already built. Okay. Uh, uh, and we have even more we, from stage one. We have the full order. Uh, they're looking at getting additional vehicles so that they, we can put vehicle 14 out without the TCMS issue and we have additional spares. So we're, we're, we're adding more to the fleet so that we can, uh, we can uh, support uh, customer volumes and, and make it more comfortable for everybody. And by the way, the testing will start in December. Okay, so we'll have 14 vehicles uh, on, uh, on the tracks and several vehicles as backup in the case of a breakdown or a swap out or what have you. 
Correct, and if we choose to, we can go right up to 15 when those, yeah. you know, the, the backups to the backups are in place without the TCMS issue. Perfect. So, what kind of real life uh, improvements to the customer experience can regular commuters expect when 14 goes on to the uh, into service? What you'll see is, um, I think it's around 8:10 in the morning. Herdman will not be as congested because you've picked up a lot of people from the east end going westbound. Uh, Tunnies will uh, will see additional vehicles coming in and out. So again, right after 8, 8, 10, that's when your peak of your peak starts to increase. So um, you'll just see a more comfortable ride and uh, there'll be more room on the trains um, and it's a better customer experience overall. Will it have any impact on the uh, platform crowding at the bus platforms in terms of people arriving and being dispersed differently as a result of the extra capacity? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think you'll see benefits across all modes and um, you'll see less congestion, more comfortable on, on the trains themselves and uh, whether we go to 14 or we go to 15, there, there's, there's pros to both. So there's pros to both. Uh, why wouldn't we just make the decision then to do it? Like, what's the, what's the reason not to do it? Uh, because if it can't consistently depend on a non-TCMS failure, so in the morning, uh, if there's a vehicle, vehicle 16, as an example, that they're trying to get out into the sequence um, and it has a TCMS failure in the yard, it just stays there. We don't want to risk the vehicles in service. We're trying to get... Um, 13 vehicles that don't have any TCMS issues and then they also have vehicle 14 and 15 on full standby. So for example this morning uh, just after 7 there was a vehicle issue we swapped it out. Last night uh, there was a um, there was a soiled vehicle by the way and somebody asked what's a soiled vehicle somebody unfortunately urinated in the vehicle we pulled that out we, we launched vehicle 14 as the backup and so forth so we're consistently getting 15 vehicles ready that don't have TCMS issues or have not experienced fault codes in the yard whether it's a TCMS or a uh, VOBC are you keeping the two vehicles paired together uniformly or are have you been swapping the different vehicles together to create the trains they stay together as much as possible, but they do decouple them for maintenance and then recouple them and test them in the yard. And that's when you pick up the code issues, the, either the VOBC or the TCMS issue, when you're recoupling them. I think at one meeting you had mentioned that um, RTG had not at that point yet had a, a yard master, like a harbor master for the, for the train yard. Has that been put in place yet to help manage the flow? They uh, they shared their present their reorg uh, to Mr. Kanalakis and I yesterday. We like what we're seeing. Uh, we're getting our experts in to go a little bit deeper as to whether or not uh, um, their uh, examples like the position that you and I have talked about. I'm not sure it's there yet. I want to see it. Um, and uh, there's benefits to it. Okay. And uh, they are doing some good improvements organizationally. Perfect. Um, so I, I like the new email that we're getting every day uh, from you or Troy. I think that's uh, very effective. I do have one uh, question or concern, um, and it relates to some of the verbiage or adjectives that are used. And I, I know this seems minor, but last night the update was there were no major delays or some, something like that that seemed to make it sound like everything went okay. And I know for a fact, at least in, in Orleans, there was at least one 45-minute delay to bus service. So I'm trying to understand, you know, is that not considered a major delay or? No, uh, and I apologize for that, Councillor. On the bus service side, you're absolutely right, and I know you communicated out to me, as did others. We struggled with bus service yesterday. Uh, there were cancellations and delays that we haven't seen at that level uh, in the past. We've been doing very, very good. And uh, yesterday was a bit of a struggle, and it was because of so many weekend things, we couldn't get operators out and so forth on overtime and so forth. Uh, and I am speaking to Troy about that. He didn't do anything wrong. I'm just telling you that uh, I think there was a bit of a, um, it's, there were cancellations, I know, out in the East End and, and some other areas. Okay. Um, thank you for that. On, on the doors, um, the door starts to close. It touches my shirt or my backpack or whatever. It'll open, and it does that three times. Is that basically how it works? That's correct. But that, it touching my hand or my backpack doesn't send it into fault. That's correct. It's when physical force is used to, to pry open the door. 
physical force or uh, in your backpack, it closes on your backpack, you're not aware of it and you're, you're, you, know, you push it and, and that's that sensitivity adjustment that we have to do. Yeah. So I appreciate the efforts on communication on, on Twitter. Um, my concern there is that I don't think regular people are on Twitter. Um, I don't know many uh, working moms or dads in Orleans that are on Twitter. If they are, they certainly don't pay attention to it as perhaps as closely as you and me and the others around this table might. How are we going to proactively go talk to average Ottawa resident who's more concerned about getting their kids to hockey uh, after work than you know following selfies that people on Twitter are taking? Sorry, Kat, I, I agree with your comment. I'm, I'm not on Twitter myself either, I, although I read lots of Twitter accounts uh, and get lots of tweets forwarded to me. But in terms of what context are you talking about? You had mentioned that you're going to do an aggressive campaign about the doors on Twitter, and I'm just I'm wondering what else are we doing outside of Twitter? No, uh, that's a great question. So we, uh, er everything under the sun, uh, including the, uh, you know, the cardboard door hangers in the buses at the stations, all those um, ad spaces in those stations, we have exclusive rights to those. We'll put lots of uh, promotional material in there and so forth. And again, uh, through counselor's office, we can get you information. You can blast it out through your emails and your distribution lists, newsletters and so forth. Have you done one of those, um, you had those busology vignettes about uh, perfume and, and all sorts of stuff. Do you have one about not doing this, like on the doors? Yes. Yeah. We have the whole trainology thing that we want to roll out on backpacks and doors and spacing and all that stuff. Okay. Um, on the extra buses and their costs, I know it's being uh, paid for by the holdbacks, etc. I think it's clear that something is amiss in terms of what we thought would be the bus requirement when we originally did the business case, however many years ago that was, or, or what have you. Um, do we have to update the, the, the long-term financial model to account for this we are updating the uh, long-term affordability model, yes, to incorporate this and a number of other uh, things that have happened in the last little while. So we should expect to have an update probably by Q1 of, of 2020. Okay, and given that, uh, again, clearly there was some, you know, there's a difference between what the expectation was when we did the business case of the operational plan to what's happening in real life now with stage one, are we reviewing our, our assumptions about stage two at the same time as you update that plan? Operationally, we are. Yeah, in terms of how many buses we would need in the flow and et cetera. Yes, uh, both from a detour perspective and also an end state uh, perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, recognizing the scope and scale of change is, is very much less. And you wisely chose as a council to set yourself up for stage two bus route extensions in stage one. So you, you, you set it, the network up so that stage two builds off of that. But absolutely, Councillor, uh, it's back to the lessons learned and, and what adjustments and tweaks do we need to do and uh, uh, modify. Uh, so the operational assumptions, we're absolutely looking at that. Okay, and just to confirm from the slide, the, uh, the 19 uh, buses that are intended to come into service, I appreciate their budget contingent. We have the vehicles and they're certified. It's really just the approval of the budget and the updating of the schedules. Uh, correct. Yeah, there's a, a big order of continual bus replacements that's coming on, including the bus detours for stage two and so forth. So uh, the, the buses are arriving. We, we, pre, we, we ordered those cause, uh, through the replacement program. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your uh, report and the updates. Um, for my residents, um, I, I actually don't hear a lot about the train. It's still about the buses and um, still a lot of concerns. Um, uh, I, I got emails this morning again um, and uh, mostly it's about lateness and missing buses. It's still happening. Um, of the 40 buses that, uh, that were put on, you, you mentioned routes that were going to be covered off. Uh, what flexibility is it? Because you're not mentioning ones that I'm getting emails about at all. Sorry, Councillor, what was the question I didn't hear? It, the 40 buses, the extra buses, um, what's the flexibility of, of uh, putting them in different places? Because you listed off some routes that were, were going to be helped, but you missed like the 87 is the big one that I'm getting a lot of uh, flack on in terms of it being late and missing. 
So I immediately followed up uh, after the Transit Commission. Pat Scrimger is coming to see you to walk through those 40 buses and have any of them been deployed on your routes. And I also forwarded in the emails that you sent to me about concerns and issues. So we're doing a deep dive on those routes and those complaints and making sure that we get it right. So that for the January, he has the codification for January now. He can tell you exactly what he's going to be doing for those routes. I appreciate that. One of the things that I'm hearing about is um, the accuracy of GPS um, when it says the bus is going to come. People are getting apps and, and they're, you know, it says when the bus is coming and it doesn't come at that time. What can we do about that? So generally speaking, the, uh, the next bus arrival on the tech service has been very, very good. We gave you an update uh, at the last Transit Commission. We did have a th our third party that hosts that had some technical challenges. Uh, so I don't know how dated you know the concerns are, but if you're getting those again this just morning, this morning, okay, let let us know, and and the specifics are important, so we can trace it back. We can go into the system and look back as to what route and why the delay and so forth, because uh, we did have some technical issues with the third party provider. Yeah, I have a note here where someone waited 30 minutes to, for a bus um, that finally came at 8:39. The GPS said it would be would be there in eight minutes, um, so it didn't work. And um, I'm getting messages like this uh, on a regular basis. Send, it, send that specifics to me and I'll, I'll add that to Pat's list. I, I really appreciate it because one of the things I heard from my residents and Councillor Harder won't want to hear this so she should cover here wherever she is because they, they want to jump on the 200 series buses because they see them go by and um, they, uh, they see them half empty. Um, and um, because their bus isn't there, they're... they're uh, you know, frustrated. This is at like Lincoln Field stations, the, at the actual stations where they see them go by. Um, so I, I, I feel like the, this is a lot of pressure. They're all, uh, that's never come up before. So um, I just wanted to give you an idea of the extent of their concern is that uh, these things happen. Um, in terms of buses that have nothing to do with um, the uh, trans or the um, LRT, these are the like the 153. Um, I've had residents still complaining that they're waiting over 30 minutes, and the majority of these people are seniors. Um, I've had some of them write in and um, pass on their concerns to your staff, um, and one of the responses they got was if they feel that they're waiting too long, they should call uh, paratranspo instead. I'm not making this up. That's the response they got, that um, when they complained about seniors having to wait for buses, um, you know, up to 40 minutes sometimes, they were told, well, they should look at paratranspo so they can get door-to-door -door service. Uh, I was appalled because <laughs> that, that response came from the staff. Um, so we certainly uh, uh, responded to that back, but I will point that out to you, that um, it shouldn't come to that, that, that that's the kind of response we're getting. Well, you have my apologies, Councillor. I agree with you 100%. And uh, I can tell you that in the new year, we're going to be bringing forward... Uh, our uh, customer service improvement program, we've, uh, we've done an assessment of the entire operation. I brought in an expert uh, that's run call centers and service centers, and he's identified and uh, many of the gaps that all of you have brought to me in terms of responsiveness, the right level of resources, call waiting times, para booking, all those things. So that's, uh, that's coming in the new year. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the t 20 buses that are waiting at the stadium, is there any chance that they could, uh, maybe not immediately, but be made into, be prioritized as electric buses so we don't have them running? No, uh, they're diesel buses, uh, and as I said, a transit commission, they have to uh, uh, be running. Otherwise, when you need them, there's a warm-up period for diesel buses. In terms of electric buses, you've approved a, a $6 million envelope. We're working uh, uh, with Ottawa Hydro and the suppliers on get, uh, bringing you forward the electric bus pilot. Uh, so we don't have electric buses in our fleet right now, but you are getting a few of those that will be deployed out to service. No, I'm talking about in the future because um, there is a concern about having those buses running. Um, so uh, the, with the electric buses, we won't have that. Uh, the yeah, the there is a premium to go to electric buses, and we've committed to bringing you a major report which ties into the affordability plan of uh, council needs to make a policy decision if you want to move to 100% electric buses or a mixed fleet and so forth. So we're putting that together. It's not 
it's not soon, it's coming, and there's massive replacements on the diesel side. So we've committed to bringing you that view both through the TMP and through the Transit Commission in terms of where you want to go with fuel uh, alternatives. Uh, and, and just to be clear, there's people lobbying us to get into electric buses, there's people lobbying us to get into CNG, uh, hybrids and so forth. So it's, it's all fuels that are on the table. Well, we had a meeting yesterday about, uh, with the, um, uh, the sponsorship group on, um, on climate change emergency, and uh, we're talking about um, zero emissions, and you know, like in 20 years, we're talking about working towards these goals. So um, I'm hoping that, uh, we'll be on the, that uh, transit will be on the forefront on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Luloff, please. Thank you very much for your presentation today, guys, uh, and thanks for your continued collaboration with us. Uh, you've added, uh, you've done a lot of work for us in the East End. Um, you've added supervisors to our two stations at Blair and Place Orleans. You've added buses to our 39 uh, at, uh, to Blair on, on the morning peak. You've added a route that connects the villages to Orleans Woods, to Convent Glen, Chapel Hill, Sunridge, and Innes. Uh, you've pushed through our stage two information night uh, for the East End, which is taking place this Thursday at Bob McQuarrie. Uh, you take my calls at all hours of the day, John, uh, and deep into the evening, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, your team has accepted every single piece of feedback from my residents, and I know you're listening, and I know you're working hard, uh, so thank you. Uh, it is International Persons with a Disability Day, and so before I ask my first question, I just want to share something that we've observed at Blair Station. At PM Peak, uh, a passenger with a guide dog was trying to navigate her way to Post E after disembarking the train. The overcrowding was so overwhelming that the dog couldn't move in the crowd at all. Thank goodness, uh, Ottawa is full of generous uh, and kind people, and somebody took her by the arm and walked her to the stop and stood with her until her bus came, so we're thankful for that. But Blair Station was not designed to be an LRT terminus station, obviously. Uh, but it will operate as one for the next four years. Um, my question is, uh, what improvements have been made at Blair Station since your last update to us? Um, and what changes are you planning in the short term to deal with the overcrowding issue that we continue to see at peak periods? So we have a multi-prong approach. Um, all of the East End councillors talked about uh, the overcrowding to us. Uh, we've started, I believe, this week to get rid of some of the glass panels on the shelters. That's step one. We're going to watch that very closely. Step two is um, do we eliminate some shelters? But then, then you're left with the question of how do you shelter people from the elements? So I've got a, 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 an amazing team looking at uh, if we have to eliminate the shelters, can we put some temporary uh, condition, cantilevered ones to protect them? That opens up the entire area. So it's three phases of, uh, and we're going to move quickly on it if it doesn't resolve the problem, uh, all towards bridging us to the opening of stage two. So the goal is to improve the flow throughout that whole station. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we, we have to take a serious look at whether or not we can encroach out into the paved portion. I didn't go there yet with the team because there's only so much they can handle right now in fairness to them. They're, they're looking at every option. For sure. So uh, it is crowded, it is busy, and uh, you know, it's what I tell RTG every single day when there's a, it's a delay on the train. It's not just the delay on the train. Those terminus stations and herdmen take a big hit. Sure. And it's, it's seconds. It's not, it doesn't take half an hour. It's immediate. You feel that immediate response. Last week or 10 days ago when we had to drop two trains at Serville and those passengers had to come out of Serville, that was a very busy, intense area. So I understand it. Multi-prong approach. Great. Um, the three trips that you did add to the 39, are those additions going to be permanent? I believe so, and this all speaks to what Councillor Harder, what Councillor uh, Kavanaugh and others are asking for. Pat's going to give you a list by ward, by route, before we launch the January uh, PC. They literally finished it this weekend, so we're going to get you that information, and, uh, and then if, if there's any questions on it, but I'm sure with all the extra service that we're adding, you'll see that we're, uh, we're filling a lot of those gaps. So it'll be route, time, and trip, and so forth. You may have just answered this question, uh, but with the next service change, will there be an augmentation to other routes in the east, like the 200 series routes? Uh, we've got the highest ridership in the city, but we're still experiencing capacity issues, especially uh, at PM peak uh, at Blair Station. 
It's routes, trips, frequency, bus type, everything's on the table, and Great. that's what we're going to get you. And, and if you don't see the level of detail when Pat gives you your list, we can meet with you, and he's got a whole team that can meet with you about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Luloff. Councillor Dudas, please. Great. I, um, I wanted to also add uh, my congratulations on seeing a significant improvement. Um, I know I take, I take the bus and the train regularly, and since those 40 buses were added, I don't think I've missed a bus. Uh, there, there, there was some issues yesterday, um, but you know what? It, you explained that, so thank you for that. But I have to say it, it has been a significant improvement. Um, I also want to mention that your team has been absolutely wonderful. I've reached out to, uh, to some of your staff, your frontline staff, who've been responding to residents directly and just thanking them as well as Ken Woods and some of your, your strong advocates on your team. So I do want to say that, you know, your front line is amazing. Management has been great. I've been meeting with Pat um, and that it's, it's an ongoing process, right? And I don't know that we'll ever come to the end of it. I think that there'll constantly be need for improvements, but I'm very glad to hear around this table that, you know, we're asking questions about LRT, but we're also now moving on to the experience of buses. So it seems like we've kind of hit that, that uh, stride and we're starting to look to the future of how we're going to to improve and expand. I did have a, a question though because you know your communications have improved. I have to say that has been great for counselor but also counselors but also for uh, residents and, and cu customers but you know one I'm just going to give one example a uh, fouled train um, there was a tweet that went out about a foul train. I don't know if it was a typo, I'm not sure, but I have noticed there's a couple of tweets that are going out, a couple of shares that are going out, and people don't understand acronyms. They don't necessarily know the terminology. I don't know if that was a real word or if that was just a mistake, but I'm just wondering, do you have communications in place where it's real world um, language, common language that people can understand? As I said, it has been getting better, but I'm just curious as to whether you're working to improve that. Yes, and uh, that's the example I was citing earlier on. Unfortunately, last night at rush hour, somebody chose to urinate in a train. <laughs> and so the person that put that tweet out should have said, bracket, urinated. You know, this morning we had somebody vomiting on a train. Uh, and so they use, fa it's, that's part of the challenge. Uh, Well-intentioned people, they're using these technical terms. So we've got people in there coaching them on make it conversational and make it plain English and, 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 and plain French. I'm pretty sure the city uses that for when a pool has been fouled as well, too. So it's, uh, but but we have to keep in yeah. mind that people don't always get the terminology. So I think you know, as awful as your nation is, let's, let's use the common language. Um, I also want to uh, to ask a quick question um, in respect to the 131, the the 231. I know I had a good conversation with Pat Scriminger about how we can improve services to that. Um, there have been issues continually, though, with packed buses on the 231. Um, I will continue to work with Pat to find solutions as well as Councillor Luloff because the 131. But I think that there's opportunities, not just in in my ward and not, but across the city, that we could look for buses that uh, are maybe some of the redundancies we can we can add more uh, service to the routes that we absolutely need it um, and I think that while we've started a very fulsome conversation with your team in respect to how we see things on the front lines I, I think that there's more improvements that could be seen and experienced by our residents so um, Maybe I'm just highlighting that one route. There's a number of other routes that I'll continue to work with your staff on. But now that we've kind of hit that stride, now is the time to start looking for whether we can start rolling into better service and whether there are redundancies as well too. Because as Marion pointed out, we're going to have to start picking and choosing pretty soon once we get a really fulsome LRT service as to how we can uh, improve but start saving money as well too. Thank you. Great, thank you. Counsel Councillor Eglai, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a, a question and, and a comment, I guess. Uh, Mr. Manconi, one of the suggestions that I've raised and I've, I've never really heard back from, from uh, OC about is I have a cluster of three communities, Manordale, Craig Henry, and, um, and Trent Arlington. Each has a bus that runs from Tunnies to their communities, um, which is ideal. But that bus isn't always there for a variety of reasons. We know there are issues around. Um, so what happens is 
people jockey between the two platforms looking for the right bus to get onto, um, which clogs up between F and G, the two platforms, uh, causes people to sometimes miss the bus because they can't get through the crowd. I've asked on several occasions for an explanation as to why we don't cluster the 282, the 284, and the 82 all at the same stop, which would help with, with Councillor Harder's issue of crowding, because some are now where the 270s go. So it seems to me it's an easy fix. It's, it's, I, I can't see that it costs money, maybe some sign changing, but other than that. But it would, it would take away some of the congestion, I think, between F and G. So I don't know if that's something we need to talk about more offline or what have you, but it, I understand a similar situation was addressed in Councillor Tierney's ward, and uh, th there was a cluster of, of uh, buses that were, were changed. Um, so again, I don't know if you have an answer today, and, and if you don't, that's fine. We can talk about it offline, but it just seems to me that that would be a simple, a simple fix. So that's sort of a question, a comment rolled into, <laughs> rolled into two, I guess. Um. It, it is on the list. Uh, both you and Councillor Harder have raised that. Um, it's a it's a long, complicated uh, process because it's it's about how buses go into that station and queuing up and so forth. I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I'm not passing judgment on it. Um, there's supervisors that have given us suggestions on how to requeue some of the buses. There's uh, a very tense debate about. I've got some suburban riders that's saying the urban people should walk further and so forth. That's not what it's about. It's about how do those buses get staged in Tunnies and at Blair so that they flow operationally as best as possible. Remember all that testing that we did? There was There is a science to that. We do have it on our to-do to say should we recluster and is there a better arrangement for those buses? It's not, that work is not done yet. The focus was on getting those extra buses deployed. It is on the list, I, I can assure you. I appreciate and that. And we'll look at it. Because um, it's not a question of walking further. My people can't walk any further. They're already at the end. That's not their issue. Their issue is, is jockeying between the two, between the two locations. Um, the other is, is more of a pure comment, uh, again, going to the, the 270 series. Um, some of them still have to, in my opinion, some of them still have to stop at baseline. Um, you, you've got people, there's a park and ride at Baseline, Constellation's at Baseline, Ben Franklin's at Baseline, Algonquin College is at Baseline. Um, it, um, to take that out of the mix, if you're not going to supplement it with more 74s and 75s uh, and the like to get people to Baseline, then you're just shifting the congestion issue. You're not fixing the problem. So um, I've had this discussion with the chair as well earlier on about that. Um, I'm not adverse to some tinkering with that, but if, you, if, if all the 270s suddenly don't stop at baseline anymore, um, they're effectively not stopping then from Tunney's all the way to Fallowfield. Um, and there's, there's, you're, you're going to have, continue to have congestion issues, continue to have crowding issues, just shifting them from one bus route to another bus route. So all I'm saying is, if you're going to do that, do it with caution, because you're just potentially going to create a whole new, you're just picking up the situation, dropping it somewhere else. It's not necessarily fixing it. That's the, again, that's not a question, it's a comment, but um, baseline, as we know, is, is one of the busiest stations in the, whole, in the whole line, and there are lots of attractions there, if you follow me, uh, for, for people. And we also have them up there for people in, in the Manordale and the, in the Craig Henry area. Um, we want to encourage people to be active transportation. You take away getting to baseline in an effective way, then you're taking away those options as well. So again, just a comment, not a question. All right, thank you. Councillor Meehan, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess this is a natural follow-up to Councillor Eglai's concerns. Uh, the 200 series of buses, uh, well, we're experiencing just the, just the opposite, Councillor. We're, we're seeing the 200 series of buses fill up before people can get on to go to, all the way to Fallowfield. So I think we need a permanent solution to this. And, and uh, I think there has to be separate, they have to be coordinated, I would say, Mr. Manconi, and you know that that we've got to have the capacity there on those buses to get people to their final destination, not have them packed when they try to get on them at Tunney. So um, I'm confident that you're going to look into that. Um, just a, 
I just want to give you a compliment this morning. I was on the buses and the trains again this morning. It was a beautiful experience. It was uh, uh, without a hitch. It's just the way I dream of it happening every day. So um, thank you. Um, but the problem is getting people home from Tunney's. It continues to be um, an issue. Um, people are actually calling the office crying because they know they've got to go to Tunney's to get home. And uh, the buses are not there. They're waiting on that platform for long periods of time. And uh, I'm not telling you anything uh, you don't know. But if you're not on Twitter, you, <laughs> you don't see um, those packed platforms of people waiting in the cold. So um, my understanding is that we are go we're going to have 20 more buses um, dealing with that. But these are the buses that are sitting at uh, the baseball stadium right now. Is that the ones that are going to press into service when they are needed at Tunney's? I, I need to really understand how we're going to address this. Okay, so again, you have 40 that you've added. Mm -hmm. That's service citywide on routes that had challenges. You will, if you approve the budget, you'll have 19 that gets spread across the city also. The 20 that are stationed at the baseball stadium are in the event that there is a rail interruption. Rather than pulling off of existing routes, which is highly yeah. disruptive, they get deployed to, to bridge the rail service. I understand that, but I need to know how many buses are going to address the capacity issue at Tunney's to get people to Barhaven? Specifically to Barhaven? Yeah. We're getting you your individual list by ward, by council, by route. We've just finished that work. So it's the blend of the 40 plus the 19. So there's 59 buses citywide, which is hundreds of trips to be dispersed throughout the city. And can I, so can I tell people, uh, it, is it imminent? Is it going to be January? It's, it's, it's January. Pat just, our planning team literally works seven days a week straight for the last three weeks. We have all that done. It's codified. It's going to the bid work, uh, bid board for operators to bid. It's rolling out in January. I'm getting each councillor a list by ward, by route, by trip. You'll have that and then you'll have the opportunity to meet with staff if you have any follow-up questions okay. on it. So that we've got to get through December. Okay, um, not going to go over well, but at least there's a solution. I'd like to talk about scheduling. Uh, when I ride the buses, I'm, uh, the, the biggest complaint that people have is, and we've heard it here this morning, the bus doesn't come when it's supposed to, the bus is late, um, and people are constantly asking, why does this happen? And I'm told it's scheduling. Uh, we have contracted out our scheduling to a company in Montreal and the buses, I'm told, are sometimes behind schedule even before they start. Because when they schedule, uh, when a company outside the city schedules, they're not taking into, uh, into account the factors that, uh, that uh, affect traffic, that affect the buses. It's traffic, it's congestion, it's, it's all kinds of things. Has OC Transpo considered bringing the scheduling back from Montreal in-house the way it was done before and schedule with management and, and the planning people and, and make those routes reflect the actual run times uh, so that the buses can get where they want to go on time, more on time than they are right now. Because if, a, if, it, if it takes longer for that route than, it actually do, than it's actually scheduled for, we're, of course we're going to be over, uh, it's going to be late. And it's going to snowball over the course of the day. Have we considered bringing this back in-house? Councillor, I, uh, I don't know where this information is coming from, but we have not privatized our planning and scheduling function. We have, the software gets run out of a firm by Montreal, but we have a dedicated planning staff that put all the inputs into that process. It gets modeled. It's a very complex algorithm because you have interline bus routes and so forth. All those elements get factored in, including drive time, congestion time, time of day, all those factors. And there are multiple iterations of that model that gets done uh, and assessed. And the quality uh, assurance and the checks get done by professional in-house team that we have under our control. Um, so we haven't privatized the planning of our schedule. And on top of all that, we take all of the, um, the, uh, the operators have logs when new routes, when they start those new routes, so in January, you, you take your new route, if you're on whatever route, 271, if you have issues on that route, so the timing isn't enough for signal changes and so forth, that gets put, that runtime gets added to the schedule if it's consistently a problem. Uh, we have supervisors that are, review the scheduling. We have op an operator committee uh, that reviews it before we finalize and so forth. So there's a bunch of checks and balances in the process. 
Is it possible then that we need to uh, take another look at it and maybe change some of the data that's going in to better reflect what's actually going on in the road? That happens with every uh, schedule change four times a year. Uh, and it literally, there's a whole team that does that. That's all they do is look at every single route. Remembering that every day you move 325,000 customers, mm -hmm. trips, and there's 8,200 trips. And I'm not minimizing at all the, my bus was late or was it busy and so, or the bus was full and so forth. But there's a lot of successful trips that you don't hear about. Oh, I, I agree and, with that. And so the recovery time, the signal time, so forth. Part of the challenge is that when you do have a congested day or a snowy day, those buses are just like your car. They're stuck in traffic. So you can throw that schedule out the window. If they're stuck in snow, just like you are with your car, that bus, you can hope all you want. It's not going to get there any quicker because you want it to. Okay, I guess I, I'd like to talk to you more about the scheduling if I can at another time. Uh, maybe we'll Absolutely. sit down. Um, when it comes, going back to Tunney's again, with the 20 buses sitting at the baseball stadium, it, would it be possible to move perhaps 10 of them over to the Tunney side to address that busing issue now? Um, that they'd be closer than having to, you know, use up fuel all day and sitting over there and then drive. Could, could we have them on this side where they'd be more convenient to hop onto the, into Tunney's to pick up those Barhaven people? Remember, those 20 are not for regular service. But uh, could you not just have 10 doing the regular service and 10 address the issues of, no? No, you need those 20 in the event that you're going to bridge the rail service if there's a problem. Now, we, the 20 that are there, we are dispersing them a little bit in terms of locating them across the network, but they're not for regular service and they're only available in the morning and the afternoon peak uh, periods. Okay, uh, interlining. Uh, this is where the a bus starts uh, on one route in the morning and then is transferred to another. Is there any way that we can make that more efficient, where the interline the buses that are interlined stay in the same area instead of having to go out of service across town and and work over there? And I mean, it, it makes mon I think it makes more sense to save fuel, and uh, would make more buses available faster. Um, so pre LRT, you have the most interlined system in North America. It. Uh, Post LRT, a lot of that is coming off, so yes, absolutely right. Our goal is to balance interlining with buses staying in their geographical area. That increases your reliability and avoids you deadheading to another route. Uh, if you're a pure theoretical person, you can interline and optimize your system to the max, but then you get into sub-optimization. That's our whole discussion when you and I meet. I can take you through all that stuff. But with LRT, you're doing less interlining than you were in the past. One last question. Are we considering hiring more fair inspectors? Because uh, I'm told, and, and from drivers and people, they, they continually witness people jumping on the buses. And once they're on the bus, it's they can go down and to get on the train, and it, it is happening. And the bus drivers can't. They're driving. They can't enforce it. Can we, can we consider that? A couple of things. Uh, you have a uh, fair audit coming that Mr. Hughes is doing. I've already spoken to him about it. I welcome it. Um, you can hire... Um, Many, many inspectors, but you've got six, seven hundred buses out in the road, so you know the math is straightforward as to how many you need. But we only the, have three now, right? Uh, no, we have more than that. I believe we have uh, actively six on a shift, but we so we do concentrated blitzes. The the key to uh, fair enforcement is uh, fair gates as much as possible. And we've done that on the LRT. We're all we got the paid fare zones. We're also doing that on the BRT. We use PTIF funding to do uh, some fair gates and fair vending machines. Uh, as you extend out to stage three, you can possibly get rid of rear door boarding. But I also, just as a footnote, and I'm not saying that fare evasion is not occurring. It is. And mm -hmm. I can tell you in the transit industry across North America, nobody can tell you the real number. Because a cheater is a cheater is a cheater. And whether you have fare gates there, whether you have a bus pass or a card, whatever, they're going to figure out how to get around the system. But often I hear about young people not paying. And I remind everybody, every secondary student in this town has a U-Pass. And so when you don't see them tapping while the data is being missed, we've, we collect $33 million from the uh, secondary institution. So we have that money in the bank. So um, fare evasion is a problem uh, anywhere in, North, in the world. Uh, how you deal with it, uh, I come from the, um, the mind of thought that having hundreds of fare inspectors 
is not the right answer. It's very costly and highly inefficient uh, unless you can have one on every single bus across your system. Okay, and I, I lied. One last question. So how many weeks of training are these new bus drivers going to have before they hit the roads? And are they going to be on local routes, not on, on transit, not on the, on the transit ways? So we're going to start them slower? They, they get everything they're supposed to with our MTO regulatory framework. I'll get you the exact number of days you've asked, Councillor McKenney's mm -hmm. asked, so obviously somebody's got a concern about Well, I think training. we all do, actually. We want skilled drivers to, uh, at the wheels of our buses. Councillor, I have to be very crystal clear on this. We've had people that have died in our accidents, mm -hmm. and I can tell you we're audited by MTO, we were audited by the TSB, and every single operator that I put behind the wheel has to pass that rigorous testing and it, I can guarantee you that there's no shortcuts on getting skilled operators out there. I trust you. I trust you. We just want to hear it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I think you meant uh, post-secondary institutions at the U-Pass. Correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Leeper. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just to come back to uh, something that Councillor Brockington was asking about, which is the costs that are being uh, put on to RTG. Uh, I, I appreciate the confidence with which you tell us that uh, we will recover our costs from them. I'm just as certain that their lawyers are telling the board that they will uh, never have to pay a penny uh, and it will all get sorted out in court at some point. But can we quantify the cost of that redundancy that we're currently running? Uh, the R1 standby buses, I believe, we just answered an inquiry off the top. I think it's $95,000 a week is a the, week. Uh, the R1 bus service, yeah. Those 20 buses. Okay. Is there a threshold that is mutually agreed upon with RTG as to when we've decided the system is fixed and we are no longer holding them responsible for that cost? They have to meet all the requirements of the PA, which is a bunch of metrics in there in terms of service, AM and PM peak and so forth. So it's all defined. Can you, can you give me a bit more color on that? Is it, uh, is it fixing the, 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 the comm systems issue, the, the door issues? Is it bigger than that? It's, it's actually, uh, no, that's a great question. Uh, the way the PA works is we really don't care what the issue is. We're buying service. And AM and PM, they have to put out service to move the volume of uh, customers that we have. And they have to do it consistently and reliably. So the interruptions they've had gives them penalties against that payment. And so in terms of the, the cash, they're not getting their October payment. They're not getting their November payment because of those failures that we've, we've experienced during AM and PM uh, rush hours. So the way the project agreement works is we don't care what the issue is. I mean, we care, but it's theirs to figure out. We're paying for service and very frequent, reliable service, and they haven't met that mark. And, and so, so they, they get failure points on that data, and then they're not eligible for their funds. Would I be correct in assuming that there is a high degree of agreement between ourselves and RTG that there have been those failures, that in fact the, um, the penalties are justified? Well, back to your opening comment, they will always take the position, no, I can tell you that uh, we're not issuing the payments for October and November, and, uh, and, and they're, they're never eligible for that, by the way, down the road. It's not like they can come back. They can dispute it. There's always dispute mechanisms. But, uh, you know, we have some of the best lawyers in the P3 industry from uh, advising Mr. Kanellakis and myself. Um, she, she has taken the strong position that you're, you're heading down the right course and uh, keep doing what you're doing. So with respect to the redundancy at, sorry, $95,000 a week, uh, when, do we expect, when do we expect that we might agree with RTG that that is no longer required? So I was wondering who was going to ask that question. So your question is when does this all get fixed and when are we in that stable place? I don't have that answer for you, Councillor. The root cause of the TCMS is what I'm focused on in terms of that will define the stability piece. Okay. And I, I can assure you, the, the city manager and I asked them exactly that yesterday. And if they had a date, they would have given us one, and they didn't. They were, were focused on the containment strategy, the root cause analysis, and so forth. I think the additional oversight that I'm bringing in will start to open up that window to see if there's a line of sight as to when we can possibly be more stable in some of those areas. I think the doors and so forth are easier to anticipate. When we achieve that stability, uh, how long... 
how fast can you remove the redundancy out? Because I'm worried about a I'm worried about a big pressure in some upcoming budget. I, the the treasurer uh, says it well. At your 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 big cost significant cost is that redundancy piece. So that R1 piece, the rest your it's factored into the budget. I, I, that's a question that we're going to have to think through at point in time. It depends where we are. Are we midwinter? Are we in the spring? Are we sooner? I, I don't know. And how cautious do we want to be? Uh, I'm very cautious. Like you know, I was the one that did the three-week parallel service, which everybody was wondering why we did that. Well, now here we are. So um, we'll have to have that discussion. But it depends on when they get the TCMS issue resolved, and hopefully there's no other significant issue that creeps in okay, after that. One month of redundant of running redundant service once we've achieved stability is not a is not a huge cost, but when we get into six months of running redundancy or or a year, so I'll be curious to hear how those uh, those discussions go. Um, with respect to the R two D tour associated with stage two LRT, is the current bus capacity that we're adding into the system drawing against that? And how do we intend to make sure we have enough R two buses at stage two? No, you've got an order of double-decker buses coming in for R2, okay. uh, which get put into the fleet and we'll optimize the fleet based on where we, uh, we need it. So the R2 uh, uh, detours is not being rested. We need to manage that well. We've got the Trillium line shut down and so forth that's coming. So additional new buses will be sufficiently incremental to the current redundancies that we're offering to ensure Correct. that we can do both. Correct. Okay. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So now on to uh, stage two update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm going to walk through the three areas of the project just by geographical region, uh, starting in the uh, the south. This uh, uh, okay. Okay, so the first, so just to break down the progress and where we are, we're going to go through uh, some of the design side. So I just want to give an update on the Trillium line work, on the design that's in progress, um, some of the changes that have been made to the system, to uh, the system design to bring it into compliance with the PSOS. Um, so currently we're going through final designs on the airport station, the vehicle branding, which is uh, with Stadler for implementation, uh, and structural designs for uh, essentially the rail separation over roads. There's uh, roughly 19 structures that are being built as part of the Trillium line, uh, and so we're reviewing those now. Uh, we're also going through preliminary designs on a number of other uh, elements, including the vehicles, the comm systems, and some of the stations. Uh, so I want to highlight some some changes that have been made to the stations to bring them into compliance with the, the PSOS. So these are rough renderings that are a little bit different than what you would have seen uh, at, uh, previously um, at, at contract award. So we'll go on to the next one. So Upland Station, so the, uh, the original rendering that was provided uh, did not show on the, uh, the top right of that picture. There's actually a, a fair free zone where you can walk through underneath the track to get to the other side for a future airport development. Uh, this station actually required two side platforms. The original rendering only showed a single side platform. Uh, and then we have redundant elevators. So this is the updated design. So if you compare this to the original rendering, there's significant changes. There's a staircase on the left. That's just an emergency exit, but essentially this is the, uh, the, the updated Upland station design that's fully compliant with the uh, project agreement. A couple other changes, uh, when we presented Leitrim and Bowesville, um, it didn't, we didn't show any elevators, we didn't show any stairs, we only showed a ramp. Uh, so to bring it into compliance, this is kind of an updated partial rendering of Leitrim station uh, where we have elevators on either side and a ramp and there should be a stairwell as well to, to reach the platform. So that's a, that's a change that you will see if you go back to the original renderings. Bowesville Station is the same uh, in terms of the updates. There's the ramp, which provides the redundancy, a covered ramp the full length, uh, as, as well as the elevators, which we've added to, uh, to provide access to the platform. So two kind of, I would say, not insignificant changes to, uh, to, to those two stations in order to make them more accessible uh, to the general public. 
So the other big change, and this is a flexibility that the design build team had in uh, in their contract, is it was up really up to them to choose whether they wanted to do an accurate station, uh, essentially you know, having to grade separate line bank over the rail or if they wanted to do the reverse. At the time of their presentation, they were planning to do uh, line bank over the rail. They've since adjusted that design. So this is now uh, an elevated line bank station. So the rail will run over line bank road. Um, we're still working through the connectivity uh, issues down at grade level, but otherwise this is the design that they're moving forward with. So all of these changes have now been implemented or incorporated into their designs. This is, you know, there are no costs associated with these changes, these are all just to bring them into, into compliance with our requirements. In terms of the construction, so the construction you will see, uh, I'll show you in a minute a lot of the, the photos of the work, still still kind of targeting this the section to the south where we're doing active work. The one change is they have gone in a little bit early into New Walkley Yard, um, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so all, essentially all of the areas of the south are under construction, and then the, the area to the north will be, start under construction uh, as of May of next year. So I'll just show you a quick video which kind of has a highlight of the, uh, of the work that's ongoing on the system now. So I'll show you uh, some brief construction photos of the work that's going on in Walkley Yard. On this photo, you can see in the distance, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, there is a construction worker uh, kind of in the distance. So they are rebuilding uh, Walkley Yard. They're actively, that's an active rail yard at the moment. So they're having to work around the existing Trillium Line service that launches uh, out of the existing Walkley Yard from every day. Uh, the foundations are going in place for the new building. Essentially, there's going to be a new building in place to, to handle all of the maintenance activity, uh, car wash, wheel lathe, everything that you need to maintain a fleet. Uh, so here's kind of the, a bird's eye view of Walkley Yard. You see the CN Yard there on the right, which is an active rail yard still. Uh, we're still doing deliveries down to the NRC facility uh, just south of Leicester Yard. You see in the middle of the, of the photo, there's a new track there. That's a new track that's been put in place to allow vehicles from the Trillion Line to get into service while they build the new Walkley Yard. Uh, a little bit just about the airport link. Uh, so you see a lot of activity on the airport parkway. Uh, in terms of a litmus test for tracking progress, it's really the progress of all the grade separations on the line. You'll see structures go up over the airport parkway, allowing space for future widening of the parkway. You'll see a structure going up over uplands. You'll see the structures going up over Leitrim, Leicester. And basically, all, all, every single uh, road crossing, uh, that's how we're going to track, essentially, from a high level, how they're making progress. This is a, a view, so that on the bottom is that actually an active rail link that we still use to do deliveries to the NRC facility, so that needs to be maintained throughout the construction period. And then you see this is essentially the spur that goes off for the airport link that goes off to the airport terminal. Uh, you won't see it, a lot of it's hidden away from the road traffic, but uh, they're essentially doing a, a rail grade separation over the airport parkway, then an embankment uh, up to Upland Station, and then from there, uh, again, a rail separation over Uplands Road to get to the airport. A lot, a lot of case on activity, a lot of uh, 
basic, basic construction that's happening uh, at the moment. You'll see a lot of essentially big equipment at those locations uh, building up the caissons and putting the foundations in place to build those rates, gra uh, grade separations. Just, uh, you know, the, the constructor here just painted one of their uh, caisson drilling units pink in celebration or in recognition of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So that's been out on the airport parkway for a uh, number of months now. Uh, and then we're just going to, just some quick highlights, some photos that we'll skip through of the caisson drilling activity, and then I'll show you a quick time-lapse uh, video. So essentially they're, they're coring down a foundation right to bedrock, so that's going roughly 30 meters down to get to bedrock uh, to set the foundation for the elevated structures. So this is the video, if you look at the screen on the left, this is just a time lapse of once they've drilled out the, uh, essentially into the bedrock, they're doing a, uh, they're going to lift a essentially structural steel um, that they're going to drop down into the hole and then they'll go in and they'll fill it in afterwards uh, to create that foundation. So you get a sense of the, you know, the scale of the work here. You know, it's a big construction activity that they're doing to do all these great, uh, great separations. So there's roughly 74 of these caissons uh, that need to be installed on the trillium line in order to do, to handle all the great separations. So after, after they drill out the, uh, the caisson, they put in the, the rebar, they fill it up with concrete, then there's some testing that they do just to verify the structural integrity. That's essentially you know, them building from the ground up to make those grade separations. A couple of quick shots here just uh, you know, as they, they build up the, the foundation for the grade separation. A couple of shots here just of the guideway that's being built. Uh, the next one, Lime Bank Station, uh, essentially the link from Bowesville out to Lime Bank, that's, that's the foundation for the track that's going to be laid uh, likely starting next year. Uh, and then as you saw in the video, and we've tweeted this out previously, all the rail has been delivered for the Trillium Line. They're going to set up a, a, a welding shop at that location to be able to kind of manage the quality control for all the welds and then the rail will be moved along the alignment to be installed in, at the various locations where we're adding rail or we're uh, creating new rail. So just some upcoming activities uh, for the Trillium line. So continued tree clearing, there's going to be a lot of activity on the existing line, uh, commencement of the airport link, uh, guideway construction, Walkley maintenance facility is going to go forward, that'll start to come out of the ground next year. Um, Essentially, all of the grade separations will start to go in place in the southern extension. Um, that's essentially a simple way to kind of track the progress of the project. The other kind of key indicator uh, for the project that we're tracking is the delivery of the rail vehicles coming from Switzerland, which should start to arrive in uh, middle of 2021, late 2021. So that's the Trillium line. So go, uh, I'll go through a little bit of work that's happening in, on the east extension. Um, so just in terms of the, the construction drawing, so this is really where the design is finished and they're progressing to, to field works. Uh, you know, Montreal Road overpass, you know, a, the crux of the project in the east in order to get the connection out to, uh, all the way out to Trim Road, and then final designs on roadway drainage, uh, utilities, and the Green Street culvert. So there's a number of kind of key things that they need to get uh, started on next year, and so these are the ones that uh, the design is essentially complete or it's uh, in its final stages of completion. Some of the preliminary designs that we're still working through uh, with them at the moment, John Dark Station, Plaster Lean Station, Trim Station, still, still taking a look at the connectivity to those stations. Uh, there is kind of some preliminary plans, but we're trying to kind of make sure we take a holistic view on how we get to all of those stations. Orlean Station is not on the list, but it will be next uh, in terms of their construction packages. Um, going through all of that work now to make sure that we're ready for construction. The schedule, uh, so you've seen a lot of activity out in the east, especially around the Montreal Road. There's a big uh, setup there in terms of uh, a staging area for the work. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, you see some of the kind of preparatory work. There's a, a couple of major water mains that are being replaced. There's the, the Highway 174 uh, and Montreal Road uh, interchange widening, which is really the crux of the project uh, in the east. We'll go quickly to uh, the next this is a description of the work. Essentially, we're widening the Highway 174 to make space for the station in the middle of the highway. If you go to the next slide, you'll see just the configuration. It's a little bit difficult to see, but essentially yellow is where the roads 
are now and green is where we're going to. So still maintaining uh, you know, the two lanes in each direction plus a lane for the transit. Um, so the three lanes are essentially being moved out of the way so that we can build an elevated station above Montreal Road at that location. So there's going to be a lot of activity, a lot of shifting of lanes, a lot of widening of lanes to ma essentially make space for the LRT station and the LRT running down the middle of the 174. So you'll start to see some of that work, uh, you know, pretty quickly here. Um, you know, they need to do some foundation work. They need to put in some shoring to be able to move that uh, that the highway lanes over to make space, uh, and then do. A, there's a couple of water main uh, replacements that run under the 174, so that work is bundled in with this project. So that's a quick rundown of the work in the east and the west. Uh, in terms of the construction drawings, so this is really where they're, they're ready to start work. Um, I think everyone's seen the, the work on the Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway. They've already done a shift. Essentially, we're trying to get the entire S-Jam out of the way so we can build the cut and cover tunnel. So that's kind of a primary activity that's happening now. Um, there's a number of, here it's called a pedestrian overpass. It's really the car overpass over the pedestrian underpass. So the structures that allow you to get from, uh, you know, essentially across the Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway to the NCC land. So all of that design is, is underway now. In terms of final designs, we're still Golden, Goldenrod Bridge. It's a new one just at the far side of Tunney's, which will allow for a, a traffic reconfiguration in that area. A couple more pedestrian underpasses that get you over to the NCC lands. And then Lincoln Fields, there's an elevated structure there, which is going to be a, a complex structure to build. Um, we're in final design on that. Preliminary designs, essentially stations across the alignment in the west. Um, also looking at the, the maintenance facility that we put in at Moody. Um, a number of the ramp designs working closely with the MTO to make sure they're satisfied with the ramp designs and the configuration of how we get, uh, you know, how we change that to make w space for the LRT. Construction schedule, uh, no change here in terms of what we've previously communicated. Still looking at uh, next year to start the cut and cover tunnel. Uh, that work starts right away. And then we, we have activities ongoing throughout the alignment in the other locations to, to get ready. Uh, the last kind of segment to, to be started is that little, little bit between Tunney's and Dominion. Uh, and we're holding that off till the end uh, to, to kind of push that out in the schedule as long as possible to minimize the amount of time that we have that section on detour. So a lot of tree clearing. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussions and questions about this, so we did want to touch on this briefly. Um, they're roughly 70% done, I believe, across the alignment, uh, east-west connectors, uh, who's doing the work is. Um, you know, there's still some work that's left to be done to make space. Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway, there's still a little bit more work to be done there. Lincoln Field, still a little bit more work. Um, so we're doing that really just to make space for the LRT. Um, the next photo shows the uh, the tree clearing at Iris, obviously making space for the station. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the tree mitigation strategy because we're doing a bit of a different strategy between the two projects. Um, on the Trillium Line project where we had to create space for the airport link, there's not actually space to replant trees. And so in order to, to compensate for the tree removals, we're doing a transfer of funds to the city's forestry department so that they can essentially reallocate the replacement throughout the city. Um, for the Confederation line, there is space. Um, w trees are replaced at a two to one ratio. Um, the species and nature, uh, there's been questions about that from a number of councillors, um, are really part of the, the landscape package design where east-west connectors has to come back and demonstrate to us where they're putting trees, what's the, the species of the trees, the, the quantity, the size of the trees. Essentially at a two to one ratio is the simple math, but you know, when we take out a larger tree, uh, the ratios can be higher. So just a little bit of a close up on the construction of the tunnel. So there are two new tunnels being put in place. Uh, the big one, obviously the two and a half kilometers through uh, the S-Jam. So if we go to the next slide, you can see a little bit of, um, the yellow is essentially the end state for the, the parkway. So the parkway is changing. Uh, its end state is being pushed further away from the shoreline a little bit. Um, so it's a temporary condition where we push over the S-Jam towards the river to make space for the cut and cover tunnel. And then once, uh, once the tunnel's re essentially finished, then we can do the final work to reinstate that final kind of circuitous path uh, for the S-Jam in that area. So straight line shot for the tunnel, but a bit of a, you know, a wavy line, yellow line there that you see for the final end state for the S-Jam. 
So the first, uh, the westbound shift has been completed. Uh, you know, we're starting to do construction to enable another eastbound shift uh, in the spring 2020. That will enable us to get the SGM out of the way entirely to start the construction on the tunnel. Um, quick photo of some of the work. You would have seen uh, the shift happened uh, about a week ago uh, in this area for the westbound, and so we're getting ready to do a shift in the eastbound in the spring. Some upcoming activities for the Confederation Line. So Byron Linear Park, there's a major hydro pole and bell line re relocation that needs to take place. A um, number of utility relocations. Iris Culvert, uh, you know, as part of that, that entire area being reworked and the, the pond restoration and the, the stream work, uh, you know, there's a culvert that needs to be moved there. Um, so a lot of activity happening in and around Iris to kind of essentially prepare for the future work that has to happen. Uh, so that essentially covers the, uh, you know, the Trillium line, the Confederation line, east and west. But the other kind of moving part in all of this is the stage two order of vehicles. Um, so we just wanted to give you an update on where we are with that. Um, so there is an additional 38 vehicles that are being built. Um, you know, a split of uh, assembly at this point being done, some in Ottawa and some moving to the Brampton facilities. Uh, the next challenge for us is really to test those vehicles and put miles on them in order to get them into service. So the next slide gives you a bit of an overview of how we plan to do that. Well, here's, we do a number of tests at night during engineering hours when it's out of service. We need, uh, we need Alstom to safety certify the vehicle. We also need the signaling supplier to safety certify the vehicle. Once we have those two things in hand, really the next step is for us to have the comfort uh, to to make them available for, for regular use. And so in order to do that, we are working with RTG to establish kind of a minimum number of kilometers that we want to see on those vehicles before we put passengers on them, uh, before we use them as part of normal, normal service. Obviously, we don't want to finish them, put them into service, and have uh, immediate service issues with those new vehicles. So we are planning, once we have the safety certification on those vehicles from RTG, we are planning on running vehicles in this, roughly in this configuration, in out of service hours, clearly marked uh, to, or during service hours, late though, off peak, um, mixed in with regular traffic to get additional kilometers on these vehicles to essentially prove them out uh, to make sure that they're reliable for service. Uh, so the next, the next slide essentially shows you the status um, of where we are. So 24 vehicles awaiting production, eight vehicles in production, six vehicles are undergoing the testing. So that's the, the Alstom testing for safety certification, that's the TALIS testing, and then essentially what we're gonna call a burn-in or acceptance testing, where we wanna see a minimum number of kilometers on those vehicles uh, without failures before we put them into service. Or if there are failures that, that we know that we've rectified them and they won't occur again. So that's. Uh, those, those last six that are undergoing testing, we want to introduce those into the fleet to add essentially to the spare count uh, for the stage one vehicles um, so that we can go to that 14th and 15th train in service. And then just kind of a, a summary of some of the, the outreach that we're doing. Uh, we have a number of sessions set up uh, this month where we're going out to the community to you know, provide an update on the work that we're doing, the construction works, the end state uh, with the LRT system. Um, you know, we obviously, these, these sessions are focused on areas where there's specific construction, but if there's a, a desire for uh, broader sessions just on the overall stage two project in any part of the community, we're happy to accommodate. Uh, we've got a team working on this uh, and they're, they're eager to get out and spread the word about the project. So, you know, if there's any kind of questions or any requests for additional sessions, we're happy to accommodate those. And that's the, that's the quick update on the stage two construction. Thank you. Um, just on the, um, the the dates when the um, the Trillium line will be shut down, uh, how long will that take? And um, I know it's going to be quite a um, inconvenience, particularly for people at Carleton and so on, because that's the main corridor. Is there any way that uh, the the portion that's existing now uh, can open sooner than the whole system, or what's the rationale for keeping it all closed until everything's ready? There's a number, so the, the shutdown right now is the, uh, the first week of May 2020, uh, when the Trillium line will be, uh, have to go to the R2 service. The additional buses that John mentioned are being added 
you know, and there's a number of changes we're making, including Raven Road to kind of help improve that service. The rationale for the length of the shutdown is, in part, it starts with uh, MTO is replacing the, the highway bridge over the Trillium line. Um, they're starting that work in May. That will run at least until uh, November. Um, so they need to replace that bridge, which is over the tracks. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, which is adding a lot of time to the project, is the a grade separation over the VIA diamond. So the Trillium line does interface with the VIA service. Um, VIA is looking at expanding. They're adding more trains all the time. And so to the extent that we can separate those two lines, that will help us. That's a big portion of the project. And then there's just other elements such as rock, you know, the rock cut in the north, where we're adding more double tracking, you know, they, we just need to shut the system down to do that. So to the extent that we could shorten up the schedule, we're always looking for opportunities to do that. But at this point, with those kind of two major projects, it, it will be difficult to shorten it uh, or to keep that section of the line in service. Right. Okay, Councillor Meehan, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have to say it's really exciting to, to see this. I've been uh, trying to show people in the east uh, part of Ward 22 uh, some of the progress, but uh, so I thank you for the video. Um, wasn't able to shoot all of it, so but thank you very much. Um, my question, Mr. Morgan, is now that we know some of the problems in the design of uh, the Confederation line, um, what are we going to do to make sure that we don't repeat that? We want to have platforms that are large enough for, for folks. We want to have enclosures so people don't have to be out in the elements. Um, what, can we, what are we doing in order to address these issues? You know, we're paying attention to everything that's happening on stage one with the stations to understand, you know, is there a better way to configure the platforms? Uh, is there a different approach with the trains? You know, we're, we're taking all of that information in to see, you know, how we can, you know, if there's an opportunity to adjust or if there's an opportunity to improve, enhance the design for stage two. And, uh, I mean, okay. Uh, we think that we know that we can do much better. So um, at what point can, are we going to take, sit down and actually look at the design and say, um, this has got to be different and let's work on it now? You know, I think we're doing that now. I think that some of the changes that uh, that you've seen with the stations already um, are are a result of, you know, the changes that we made to the PA a couple of years ago and enforcing those changes now. Um, you know, if there's specific things that that we want to look at. Uh, in relation to, to the station designs. We're happy to take that feedback. We're, we're getting that feedback all the time from councillors and from, uh, from staff and working with transit to look at you know, what opportunities there are to improve the, the overall design. This is, it's going to cost some money. Um, is, that, uh, is that going to be prohibit some of the, the changes that we might expect? I think we're looking at, uh, you know, where are the opportunities, the, the, you know, the easy wins, I would say, to, to improve the service. Um, at this point, we're not going to enclose stations. Uh, we're not putting roof structures on everything. Um, that would be cost prohibitive at this point. The, we're, start, we're already seeing the problems that, that, that that's causing right now. And a lot of these stations are really out in the open. Um, don't you think that this is a priority now? This is Canada. Mr. Mayor, just a, just a couple of things. Um, the council raises some very valid things, and I can assure you there's a long list of lessons learned from stage one. We actually did a, a review of all those things. Michael reports directly to me, so it's all one department, and, and there's interfaces on that. But a couple of things. Stage one was your most difficult part of your project. Why? Because you have two terminus stations that are temporary in nature. So the Tunnies and uh, Blair situation with the high volumes and so forth, uh, that all changes with the extensions of stage two. The southern part is totally different than what you're seeing in terms of the east-west volumes and so forth. I think some of the challenges that are before you, and this is a council issue, uh, is this expectation of enclosing stations, for example. That's hundreds of millions of dollars and is not done anywhere. This is not a subway system. These are at grade stations and to enclose them and heat them and so forth. Uh, that, that ship sailed years ago, nine years ago, when you made the decision to go with this type of system. So if you go to Calgary, if you go to Baltimore, if you go to Boston and so forth where they have similar climates, they don't have enclosures in there. Those stations are open air like yours. Um, the lessons learned on both the small things that are important to the customer and the bigger things that are important to the customer, I can assure you there's a list of that that gets managed. Uh, there is a contingency fund that we can tap into that if we need to. But in terms of big wholesale design changes, there's no room for that. 
you're, you're locked into your design that you've approved uh, and uh, to those things and, and to the macro standards that drive the service. What about protection of some sort? I mean, we're putting up scaffolding at Tunney's to, to try to protect people standing there. I mean, why don't we just do it proactively? You are. I think the, the, the station renderings that you've seen, you've got that, all those stations will have that protection. You will not have the scope and scale of transfer stations that you have at, uh, at Tunney's and Blair. Herdman is an end station uh, um, uh, transfer point, and that one, with the exception of a wider sidewalk, you're not hearing the similar complaints because it was designed for end state. Tunney's and Blair, I know it's difficult, temporary stations. There was no money in your budget to enclose those stations. I heard a resident tell me to build a bridge from one end of the platform to the other so they don't have to walk around and so forth. That was never your design. You were capped at $2.1 billion and staff did the best they could. And I can assure you, I know we're going to get complaints about the scaffolding. I've already heard it. Is that the best you can do in the nation's capital? We're doing the best we can with what we've got. But you don't have those macro issues on stage two. You built the toughest part. You put the busiest BRT in North America underground with no at-grade crossings. This is the tough part. Stage two gets much, much easier. And, and the southern extension to your ward, Councillor, it's, uh, it's a complicated project, but it has a lot of the benefits of, of, uh, of a modern railroad and great stations also, and an airport link. Are we going to be looking at beefed up uh, trans transit, like buses in the outside, along this uh, transit, uh, the, the, the trains, the train line, because we need to get people f there to the, to the uh, stations? You'll have great feeder systems to those stations. You've invested in the park and ride lots. Mm -hmm. And once you get on that train at the southern end of it, remember, you'll be traffic, all traffic, car or bus, to get to downtown any day, whether it's good weather or bad weather. That's been proven on the, on the timeline. I, I just want to make sure that you know just how excited we are by seeing the progress and, and knowing that this is coming out there. Uh, but is there an opportunity for the communities, I know we're going to do an, um, um, you know, overviews with people, to get their input in what they think is going to be uh, necessary in these stations as, you know, along the way? I mean, we're going to run those uh, those consultations. We'll take the feedback where we can. Um, you know, happy to you know make adjustments where where they're simple and where it's a, it's there's an easy win there for for customers. Uh, you know, the big changes uh, are difficult at this point in time, but uh, I think there's lots of room to make uh, to make small changes and small adjustments to to the to the stations and to the trains. And so we're open to that feedback. So that's like uh, the stairs that cut the tiles, things like that, the size of the platform, th yeah. those types of things, trains with straps, everything. That's what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and can we sit down, Mr. Michael, M Mr. Morgan, and take a look at the small changes that we're, we have looked at so far? Absolutely. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tierney, please. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much. And I certainly see a lot of excitement uh, in our communities, especially in the East. You actually see a lot of the progress. Um, also, uh, from a consultative point of view and making sure people know, I'm always shocked how many people don't realize the train is going down the middle of the highway in the future. So uh, the tools that are required for us East End councillors, I'll be putting out a lot of pieces in the beginning of the year. And you guys are doing a great job. I guess uh, on the 5th, we have our East End line meeting, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but in some of the illustrations that have come out, the 3D illustrations, which are purely conceptual, uh, just to show the stations. I, I took one of Montreal Road Station underneath and I used that and I showed the fading of what it is today versus what it will be in the future and unfortunately there's a rollerblader on the sidewalk and everyone on Twitter reminded me, wow, there's a, that's dangerous. Uh, our final illustration is going to be a little more realistic and, and I'm asking that kind of tongue in cheek because there is actually a cycling lane in a very awkward position on the illustration for Montreal Road. At what point do uh, the cycling community, a pedestrian community, they all get involved to help finalize that design, especially under the overpasses? So the station renderings uh, through the design process, which we're going through now, uh, will be updated the final design. Uh, that's the requirement under the PA. So you will be able to see better renderings at that time. In terms of the connectivity, uh, all of those reviews are happening now. And so to the extent that we can get your feedback now, uh, now is the appropriate time for that. 
Okay, so on that, just just uh, so how, ballpark, and I won't hold you to a firm date, but is it you talking? Is it's eminent, like the next month, uh, six months for these final illustrations? Just because I don't want to make the investment to do any kind of uh, physical mailings or any kind of distribution and have the wrong imagery in it. Yeah, I could get you a schedule for when we expect the final renderings to be done, but I expect it would probably be sometime middle of next year for an, a f the earlier stations where the final design is complete. But I should, I'll get you the schedule so you know exactly. Okay, so just for when I'm informing my neighborhood now, I'll put, you know, this is for design purposes only, not the final renderings, Correct. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I also had a question around, uh, now people are starting to realize, yeah, you're not going to get on a bus in the neighborhood and go all the way back to Blair. Uh, Montreal Road will be your future home uh, for a hub. What point are we going to start really engaging our communities uh, about those new routes and what they could look like? Uh, the team's going to come and talk to you about what the, those new ro routes look like, and it's, we're superimposing that onto your stage one setup that we've done. So I don't have the exact timeline on that, but I can assure you that, again, everyone that is affected by any of those changes, we're going to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. And okay. then you can talk to us if you want to do a ward meeting. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Tierney. Councillor Brockington, please. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And just to go back to... Um, some station design challenges that we've seen once phase one opened. Is there actually though time to make changes to the design? I know some changes are more expensive than others, but where are we on the timelines of actual design sign off? Some of the stations are near completion in terms of their design. Um, to the extent that we get, you know, we can always make changes right till the end. They cost more at the end, you know. So if we get your feedback now, we can, uh, we can get those in and try to get them in at no cost, uh, depending on the nature of the changes. So the, I didn't see any updates today on Walkley Station and South Keys. Where are they right now as far as design goes? Yeah, I don't think we've seen the preliminary designs for those just yet. Uh, they've been focused on some of the stations in the south, uh, largely because um, that's where they can start work right away. Uh, and then I, you know, I can review with the team uh, the status of those uh, for your information. Um, those change those. Station designs haven't changed a lot, and so today part of the renderings that I was bringing forward were really to highlight the, the changes, the significant changes that have been made since you would have seen the, the renderings at contract award. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of those changes. Uh, Walkley and Gladstone and those other stations, Bayview, I'm happy to, to go and find out the timing for when you'll see those final designs so you can inform, you know, make, make, have an opportunity to, to provide some feedback. I would like to request that we sit down to specifically look at Walkley and South Keys stations. Those are the main stations my residents will be using, particularly the design inside and out. I guess, you know, at the end of the day, I could be arm twisted to agree with stations uh, that are open aired as long as people are safe. And the one issue that I've raised repeatedly is at Herdman Station where that north side of the station for people who arrive and are transferring to come downtown, it's all open. And my concern is um, as we get freezing rain, snow, all types of weather events that that may impact people's ability to climb safely up and down those stairs. That's what I'm worried about. So I'm, I'm not as worried about it being cold as I am people being impacted by weather and those that uh, getting inside our stations. Just like when I see some of our fare boxes out in the open, I think Tunney's has some facing uh, Scott Street. I'm not sure that's good. I want people to be covered and at least comfortable when they're buying tickets. Um, and I'm also concerned about the impacts on the machines over time from, from just weather. Um, I do like what I see. I mean, I travel the airport parkway. Um, you know, Walkley Yard is in my ward and, and there is definitely progress. It generates a lot of discussion in the community and, and it's good to see that. So appreciate the update in that regard. Um, the EY Center, just the, the name Uplands, is that a holding name for the station? Are we actually gonna have some sort of public opportunity to name that station or, or what is it gonna be called? I don't recall where we are on that process. Uh, we had a naming process for uh, 
stage one. Councillor, can I get back to you? Yes, I, just, I need to check with staff. I know we've talked about it. I just uh, lost track of where thank we are you, with that. Thank you. And again, just to confirm, I mean, huge benefit to the EY Center to have a station built on their property, shuttling convention attendees and others, having not having to pay for parking. Uh, obviously, I support this, but again, to confirm, there's no financial contribution Unlike the airport authority, which is uh, chipping in millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars for their station, no financial contribution being made by the EY Centre for this station. Is that correct? That's correct. That's no different than you, Ottawa. <clears throat> okay. Um, the mayor touched upon this, the Trillium line shutdown. We've had many conversations about the length of time and, and the reasons, all the work that's going on. Um, the road modifications servicing Carleton University, I've noticed a new road built at the northern end um, of their parking lot that now abuts Bronson Avenue. I um, was not aware of this road. I thought the discussions about a bus only entrance and exit was going to be at the south side of, I think it's called Raven Field, uh, sort of the practice field. Is that still in the works and is this road Carleton University led unrelated to OC Transpo? Correct, Raven Road, it's a new Raven Road uh, that's being essentially creating a new access point, buses only, that's being added next year. But that would be at the far south end yeah, of the property, okay, all right. Um, obviously a number of, of R2 buses will be put on the system to uh, provide service during the shutdown. Will you be complementing or providing additional service on other bus routes? Folks don't want to take the replacement bus. Maybe they want to go from downtown to Herdman and get on um, the 97 or the 98 to get them to the south end. Are you going to be providing service as well? You can't assume that everyone's going to want to take the replacement bus. It's not as convenient, I think, if you're going from Greenboro to Bayview and vice versa. Are we putting only additional resources on the replacement service or are some of the other routes going to get additional resources as well? Councillor, I'll get you that uh, okay. from Pat and his team. I know the theme is not to make it, it, it we, I know we call it R2, but it, we want it to be a good bus route with a lot of access points and good continuity and good connection. So Pat's got those details. I'll, I'll do that as a follow-up if I can with you. If the new Civic Hospital uh, welcomes a station, a Trillium Line station uh, on their property on the south side of Carling, um, that could take quite a while to build and I'm quite concerned about another shutdown of the Trillium Line after two plus years that we're just about going, going into in May. Where are you on your discussions with the Civic and have you considered avoiding another lengthy shutdown of the line if this station was going to be built? Uh, yes, Councillor, great question. We, we actually met with them um, last spring, a whole integrated team, and talked exactly about the future and what it holds, although they're years away from actually breaking ground. Uh, that was exactly our point, is we're, we're doing, we, they know our schedule. Uh, they know that uh, we, uh, we are encouraging them to connect and orient all those facilities so that there's great connectivity there and we gave them some outside the box thinking about how they can uh, leverage the Carling station and not have to build another station and so forth. So um, great discussions with the, the hospital team and uh, we're connected with them. Very good. Very supportive of, of that possibility but again the impact on the riders uh, needs to be considered. My last question, time is running out. Can we get ourselves to a point once phase two opens that we will eventually have a seamless ability to travel from the airport to Bayview Station without transferring at South Keys? Can we get ourselves lined up to ensure that if I'm going downtown, I'm not gonna have to take three rides, then I eventually can go from airport to Bayview and then transfer onto the Confed line? So the rail infrastructure is being built to allow that, uh, to allow a through train essentially from the airport to, uh, to Bayview. So that will be in place. Uh, at that point, it really becomes a service planning decision right. about ridership and trying to balance the, the ridership coming from the south, coming from Lime Bank area, uh, with the ridership coming from the airport. Okay. Uh, we'll talk more. This has to be a priority for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leeper.
Thanks, Mayor. Uh, really quickly, first, I think I heard you say this in September, but I just want to uh, make sure the rail damping uh, to deal with the noise issue in Hintonburg and Mechanicsville is relatively imminent now. Uh, that ra same rail damping is being done proactively where the same rail conditions exist in the trench, concrete plinth uh, with the rock walls. You're going to put that rail damping in there as well? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and just curious, um, will the trains that are now in production and some being tested, will they have more or fewer kilometers of testing than the first batch by the time they go into service? They will have fewer than the first batch. The okay. first batch we used uh, for you know, a period of years for driver training, for test and commissioning of a large number of systems. Um, so there was no minimum requirement uh, on the original 34. But uh, as the project kind of ran long and we, you know, used them for additional purposes, they actually, a number of them, you know, got quite a few kilometers on them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Leeper. Councillor Blay, please. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Orleans councillors were on a conference call about economic development in around uh, stage two stations, and um, it was indicated to us that uh, station design is approaching uh, completion or uh, modifications are approaching completion. Um, but I don't think any of us have, have seen any of that yet. So I'm just wondering when we might go over some of the changes to the station design. Because as you know, um, there are some changes we would like to see. I think that the primary uh, discussion that we've had is around the connectivity changes. Uh, and so we're scheduled to do an internal review uh, early next week. And then at that point, we would bring forward some ideas for consideration, uh, especially for some of the east, east end stations in terms of potential changes. Okay, so would we would should we expect to to get an update from from you on the changes to the stations or the connectivity by the end of the year? We're aiming to get you something by the end of the year. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. That's it, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dudas. Please. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so I, I was curious. I know a lot of my colleagues have been asking about uh, station design. I concur with that, and I won't ask the same question. Uh, I do specifically want to ask about Montreal Road Station, however. Um, you had mentioned that there are plans to provide uh, connectivity to the various stations, and that work is in, underway. When can we expect to see connectivity to that station and other stations uh, across the board? So we're doing a, going through all of the stations, kind of revisiting the original design to understand where there's opportunities for improvement. And as I uh, just mentioned, we're looking to get the East End stations completed by the end of this year, or at least uh, Montreal Road might be the one exception, but the other ones, certainly Orleans, uh, plus, plus Orleans, uh, Jean d'Arc, we have that information. We've been working on it uh, with the, the planning team closely. Uh, we have some internal reviews in the next couple of weeks and hoping to get you some ideas uh, before the end of the year. Are you taking public feedback on those connectivity options? You know, as part of the outreach to the community where, you know, we'll be bringing forward some of the, the ideas once we've had a chance to essentially brief staff and brief yourselves. Um, we we want to get your feedback first and then uh, take it out to the public at that point. Mm -hmm. So in respect to the connectivity, but also the station designs, I'm hearing, um, you know, the word final said, I'm, right. I'm hearing, you know, I just want to stress, and I don't think any of us can stress enough that, that, you know, we are learning lessons just as much as you are in respect to stage one. And our input and the input from our public through us is vital uh, before it gets to be final. So, I mean, in terms of terminology, I, I don't like that word. I like to think that we still have some play on it, even if it is minor, but it's very important we get this right. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask in respect to Montreal Road Station, you have advised us, and I appreciate that in respect to the impacts on the highway and the detouring and the rerouting in that respect. What can we expect in terms of if there's any detours or impacts on the cycling infrastructure, the pedestrian infrastructure, and even the road infrastructure underneath the bridge during the construction? So 
as part of stage two, uh, you know, one of the changes that was made in stage one, uh, the mobility matters regime, essentially a lane rental regime, only considered uh, car traffic and bus traffic. It didn't consider uh, pedestrians, it didn't consider cyclists. And so in stage two, the mobility matters program now considers uh, those additional kind of lenses uh, and has a requirement in place for the builder to essentially maintain access. Um, there's new provisions in there for the duration of the, you know, if there's a, for example, a cycling detour or a pedestrian detour, if it's in place for a, a given amount of time, then they have to pave it. They can't just leave it uh, as stone dust if they want to keep it that way for, for, I forget, I think the prescribed time is seven days. Um, so there's a number of changes there that a uh, the number of obligations that we passed on to the design builder to ensure that they maintain access at all times, um, where there is a you know a detour or a change that's coming, uh, we will try to let you know well in advance so that you have an opportunity to, to review it and uh, give your feedback on that plan. And I just wanted to, to once more about that particular station. I noticed in your presentation that you know there are a number of the East End stations are in fi final um, or right. close to final. When do we, um, I know Councillor Tierney asked this, but when do we get to see Montreal Road Station? Because construction starts on that first, so. The big, uh, you know, the, the big lift on Montreal Road, which is starting first, is really the creating an elevated structure. So a lot of the, it's at this stage of the project, it's a structural design to kind of move, to shift the highway over, make essentially two new highway bridges, and then create an um, intermediate structure that will house the station. So that, that, that portion of the work is, uh, you know, very advanced because they want to start that as soon as possible. Um, you know, the fit up of the station, the, the specific details around uh, the, the footprint and the heating, those things are, are kind of all up, you know, up for discussion at this point in time. Um, Councillor Tierney was asking about the specific renderings for the station. So those typically come with the final design. Um, but if there's, uh, you know, features of the stations that you want to discuss or, you know, the connectivity of the station that you want to discuss, now is the time to do that. Well, I'm thinking specifically about the detours because that's coming fast and furious right. with this particular station. So the faster you can get it out to us, the faster we can share it, the better off we are. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Dudas. Councillor Cavanaugh, please. Thank you very much. Um, we're all excited about stage two, there's no doubt about it, um, but lots of questions to ask about it. Um, one of the questions that was asked to me by, uh, by residents, and, and you're going to get more of these questions tonight because we're going to have the uh, open house uh, for the Cleary Lincoln Field uh, section, and um, uh, certainly I expect a good turnout. Um, what do you define as a tree? because uh, you're talking about the ratio being two to one, but um, I haven't heard a definition of what you're counting as the tree that would be for the two to one. There's a, uh, the tree has to be a certain size for it to count. Uh, so there's a width and they do a survey of the trees. Um, I can get you the, the specific details on, on the replacement and on the, the measurement uh, for your area if you like. That would be very helpful because that question is going to come up uh, tonight. Um, so uh, people want to know uh, what, they're, what you're talking about. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you've mentioned that some of the larger trees are going to get even a higher ratio because there's certainly a lot of sensitivity around the fact that over 100-year-old trees uh, had to be taken down. So I appreciate that uh, they're going to higher ratio than two to one. Um, in terms of the um, differences of what we're seeing in stage one to stage two, um, what would be some of the main differences in the trains that, uh, that you're ordering? Um, are they going to have different doors, for example? The, we're ordering uh, 38 additional trains, the same train uh, for the Confederation line. The difference is we have the benefit of experience from the Stage 1 trains and any of the modifications or updates that have been made uh, will be applied to the Stage 2 vehicles. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, and I just want to comment that uh, I, uh, Councillor Brockington already asked questions about the uh, airport connectivity and connections, so uh, I look forward to more information on that. Um, in terms of connectivity, that's probably one of the biggest questions I have still. There, there's still some unanswered um, areas in terms of how to get to the stations, uh, particularly Lincoln Fields, where it's not totally clear about the access um, and uh, we have a major development happening next door to it at Lincoln Fields property formerly the mall which will no longer be a mall 
Um, and that's considered transit-oriented development, and yet the connection is, is rather poor between that, uh, that site and the station because the parkway uh, exit is between that. And um, so we've got a, an off-ramp there that comes from the S-Jam, which means people have to walk across uh, basically just an area where people slow down to yield and, and get onto Carling. It's not great. Um, in other places, there's bridge connections and there's uh, where pedestrian safety is put at a priority. And um, I wonder, um, are you open to working on improving these connections to attract more ridership? Because there's certainly been a lot of, connect uh, a lot of concerns raised about this, particularly people who live in the, um, on the northwest side of, uh, of the station in terms of trying to get to the station. I know there have been some negotiations with NCC about this, but there's still a lot of concerns because um, some of the traditional routes that they had been taking before, such as cutting through properties uh, where there was a hole in the fence and things like that to get to the station currently, um, are, are just totally in, in, unacceptable. In a number of places, uh, you know, we've worked with the development community closely. Algonquin College is contributing to a pedestrian overpass. Trinity's contributing to a pedestrian overpass. Um, in other areas, there's a, there was a natural need for one, and so that's being included in the project. But absolutely, we're, we're with you to, to look at all options to make sure people can get to those stations. Okay, so you're still uh, open to some connectivity to that property? because um, I, I'm hearing loud and clear that that is a big concern with people. And it's not just about the property, it's, it's about people just getting from the, the north, northwest side to get to Lincoln Fields. And, and keep in mind that that, that area does not, will not ever be part of the LRT route. Um, these are people that will always be walking towards the LRT station there. So uh, I appreciate it. Also at Queensview Station, um, when can we see the connectivity there? Because we still do not have a route that is confirmed. I'll have to confirm with the team on that one. Okay, because uh, it's been a long time coming. We've already voted for a budget back in March. Um, and so we'll have to be expropriating property that won't be under that uh, envelope of the funding, which is, is problematic. So I know it's a pressure on the city, but um, we do have to... Uh, decide where there's a route at that Queensview station. It's a very important station, and um, I hope to see some information on that. Um, anyway, I look forward to our meeting tonight, and thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McKenney, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to the Trillium line. Um, I wonder why the, um, the north part of the Trillium line is not going to be kept open um, as, we, as you build the, the south side. I guess I'm worried, about the, I'm worried about the Trillium line. I like the Trillium line. It, it works really well and it carries, I think, about 19,000 people uh, a day. Um, so that, you know, we're going to have buses going through the neighborhoods and uh, so Two questions, I guess. One is, you know, why we can't maintain that northern uh, part of the line, and uh, what happens if uh, stage two is is late? Like, uh, do you have any worry about um, the Trillium line being shut down for more than the planned eighteen months? So. You know, the, that northern section there, you know, there's the two big projects that I spoke about, you know, the 417 replacement over the, uh, over the, the rail line, that's, uh, you know, a major activity to replace that structure. Um, underneath that structure, we're doing rock gut excavation. Uh, there's a long section essentially between the future Gladstone station to south of the 417, that entire section, uh, you know, I don't know the, the methodology just yet, but we need to get in there and make space for uh, double tracking. Um, so that's very intrusive work. The work above with the 417 is very intrusive. The grade separation at VIA, you know, it's a, you know, essentially a, a large structure that has to go up and over the VIA, uh, up and over the transit way, up and over the creek that's at that location. So it's not a simple grade separation. A few of the other grade separations to the south over Leitrim, over Leicester, they're, they're pretty straightforward. You can drop in single span structures. The, the structure over VIA 
uh, knowing that VIA is running their service is complicated. So to, to keep the northern portion running um, essentially would, would push the schedule out for the project you know, by years. Um, so that's kind of the, the difficulty there. Uh, in terms of tracking the, the project schedule, uh, you know, I mentioned a few kind of key indicators that we're following. Um, one is the, you know, wanting to see those, uh, those structures go up in the south very quickly, uh, wanting to, to track the progress on the structures in the north, wanting to see that the vehicles arrive uh, on schedule. Um, so we'll have an early heads up to know if there's any issues uh, in that sense. Um, so it's a $1.6 billion contract. Of that 1.6 billion, how much of that is for uh, the maintenance, and what what are those maintenance pieces? So the the 1.6. Uh, so the capital construction contract is roughly 700, um, and then the remainder is all payback during the maintenance period. So it's only 700 million to build the stage two trillium line. That that doesn't seem to be enough money. I mean, I don't know anything about building. It just seems like so, not very much money to so build that line. So 700 million plus the, uh, so plus the vehicle contract, so uh, 810 million for that construction contract. Hmm. And then the remainder is for? The, the remainder is the 27 years of maintenance payments. Of that, maintenance uh, payments. If you kind of sum those up to get to the 1.6 billion. Okay. And, and you're confident that this can all be built for 700 million? Do you I, have that confidence? I've got a fixed price contract, yes. Yeah, but we've seen what's happened with fixed, I mean, that's not my question. I get that we have a fixed price contract, but if we don't get what we need, uh, we're in trouble. So I guess my question back to you is, can, can it, this system be built for $710 million? So 810, so I'll just correct, vehicles, I'm just, just yeah. looking at the note, yeah. yeah, so 810. With vehicles, uh, but I'm saying without vehicles, yeah. just let's, or with either. Let's just say with for, sure. for simplicity, sure. 810. Um, so I've got a, we've got a system that works already. You know, we've got an eight kilometer system with six vehicles that have been proven. Track switch is a system that works. So we know that it works. We've already have essentially half of a system. So this is about expanding the existing system we have and, exp uh, and adding additional track to the south. Okay. Um, so, so in that context, understanding that we already have half, essentially half of the system built, yes. So that's for if I, that's for tracks, vehicles that link to the the link to the airport, and the maintenance facility. Are that, that's correct. all included yeah. in eight hundred ten million dollars? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, both very much. Appreciate that. Uh, next, City Manager's Office, Bureau Director uh, Municipal, proposed 2019-2022 Term of Council Priorities. And we have um, one uh, speaker for this, and we have two uh, motions that I'm aware of. So, Councillor Luloff, if uh, you'd like to introduce your motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Whereas the proposed 2019 to 2022 term of council priorities include a strategic priority of economic growth and diversification, and whereas document one identifies several actions where the city will collaborate with and support other strategic stakeholders on projects that contribute to achieving the outcomes under this priority, and whereas staff has already identified a number of high economic impact and public realm projects that, while not an exhaustive list, will provide additional relevant examples of the types of initiatives that the city will support over this term of council. Therefore, be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommend council approve revisions to uh, two actions under the economic growth and di uh, diversification uh, priority as follows. Support high economic impact projects such as the Ottawa Hospital's new civic campus, the Orléans 174 Economic Corridor Study, the Smart Farm Partnership, the L5 Autonomous Vehicle Test Track and Canada North Autonomous Vehicle Test Route, and Hard Rock Casino's uh, Ottawa's expansion plans for Rideau-Carlton Raceway. 
support public realm projects to enhance public life and social interactions, such as those in the historic Byward Market and Spark Street Mall. Okay, so that's one. And second, I par Concier Cloutier, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. Thank you very much. I won't read the whereases, as the uh, the motion was circulated yesterday, and I, I sure do appreciate um, Councillor Harder and others who, who work to improve the motion. Um, the French Language Service Advisory Committee has made a recommendation uh, with respect to the implementation of the bilingualism policy and how it applies to the policies and services and the programs and initiatives to, of the city. It's the Advisory Committee of French Language Services that proposed some uh, specific uh, comments uh, on things that can be realized and that support linguistic duality of our uh, wonderful community. And therefore, this motion was supported and adopted unanimously by this uh, uh, consul consultative committee that ensures liaison and reasonable recommendations for the Council as part of the strategic priorities. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the motion has been, um, has been circulated. The, the uh, important parts of the motion in uh, three of the priorities, uh, in priority number one, uh, adds the term showcasing the city's bilingual and multicultural character. In uh, strategic priority number five, uh, adding uh, deliver quality bilingual services that are in innovative and continuously improve to meet the needs of individuals and our diverse communities. And in um, strategic priority number seven, Mr. Mayor, thriving workforce promote a bilingual service excellence by supporting a workforce that is healthy, diverse, adaptive, and engaged. And I would ask support of my colleagues on FEDCO for this motion and at Council on December 11th. Merci. So we have one delegation, uh, Andrea Poncia, Coordinator, Coalition of Community Health and Resource Centers. So there's a uh, seat there. Apologize for the, the wait. And uh, uh, Ms. Poncia, you have uh, five minutes. You just push the button there. Actually, my name is Michelle Herchibes. Andrea had to leave and my colleagues had to leave. Um, so good morning, Mayor Watson, and thank you to the members of the Finance and Economic Development Committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I am the Executive Director of Western Ottawa Community Resource Centre, but I am representing the Coalition of Community Health and Resource Centres today. Um, and uh, we are requesting that the City Council create a uh, term council priority that includes the expansion of nonprofit social services with clear targets for strengthening these services. In their 2009 book, The Spirit Level, Why Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better, epidemiologists Rick Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett effectively summarized numerous studies demonstrating that in countries with high levels of inequity, there's a higher risk of poorer outcomes across multiple indicators of health and well-being for the whole population, not just for the most vulnerable. In Ottawa, our social safety net is fraying and people risk falling through the cracks. If we draw on this science, we can see that Ottawa is at risk of becoming a city with greater inequity, a city with poorer health comes. I would like to give a couple of examples to illustrate the positive impact that an investment in social services make. Last year, with funding provided by the City of Ottawa, social services were able to support a resident as part of crisis intake service at a community resource centre in the West End. At risk for disconnection of hydro, the client was in arrears and unable to make the needed payment. The client wasn't eligible for traditional utility arrears programs due to being over the low-income cut-off measurement, but still living in, uh, in uh, low-income circumstances. With support from social services, he was able to place a 21-day hold on his account to avoid disconnection, and the client was able to make a payment arrangement moving forward. This kind of support ensures that individuals are able to keep their utilities on and therefore to continue to be housed. I use this example to illustrate that while we laud the city for including a council priority related to thriving communities, we want to stress that the current priorities do not go far enough in supporting nonprofit social services. Here's another example why this is important. City funding is also instrumental in supporting newcomers. My colleagues at a community health centre in Centre Town have demonstrated this firsthand. 
Many people come through their doors for many reasons since the Queer Newcomers Drop-In Group was established in Centretown. They come to be a safe space to connect with others and to build a community in Ottawa. And there have been an average of 48 people attending each evening drop-in, a number that continues to grow. These sessions help people reach their full capacity in our community. One group member has not only gone on to thrive as a resilient immigrant, but he is in a leadership position within the LGBTQ community, providing trainings for settlement agencies and other service providers, facilitating community discussions with federal policymakers, and organizing community champions in different cities. This group has grown exponentially because social services build connections and encourage communities to thrive. And we get many positive benefits with small investments. Nonprofit social services are innovative collaborative, effective, meaning we get a high return on investment for these services. In this case, a service that is funded for under 30K, 30,000 reaches 1,200 ca contacts per year. That's 1,200 chances to build a community leader. We also have an example of a collaborative of five community agencies who provide volunteer income tax clinics supported by staff funded by city funding. Last year, 28 um, 2,800 low-income people uh, came through these clinics and uh, through their in participation received $14 million back at income, an average of $5,000 per person, money that alleviates poverty and is spent back in our community. We appreciate that the council priorities include a commitment to supporting community to thrive, and that's a start. Indeed, our services promote safety, culture, social and physical well-being for our residents, but more concrete outcomes and indicators would clearly promote the social, in this, that's the social infrastructure sector are needed. One minute. An increased investment in social infrastructure aligns with the city's new official plan. Like the official plan, new investments would recognize that health and well-being start in our communities and health and well-being supports economic well-being. This kind of focus on social infrastructure services within the council priorities would ensure that social services continue to be there for our communities in times of crisis. As our communities continue to grow, social service agencies help more and more families who find themselves in vulnerable situations. Without an increase in focus and concrete outcomes to demonstrate our success in this area, families will go without the necessary pillars to support their basic needs. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your investment in our community. Thank you. Councillor Elshantiri, a question of the delegation. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Michelle, thank you for uh, waiting to do your presentation on behalf of the coalition. But uh, I'm more interested in, in your uh, position as an executive director of the Western Ottawa Resource Centre. Uh, how much increase in call for service your area have seen in the last two, three years? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, at the Western Ottawa, we've seen a significant increase. Uh, last year, we've almost uh, doubled the numbers coming in through our intake. Part of that was re in response to uh, us uh, providing responses to individuals impacted from both the tornado and the floods and coming in through our intake crisis line. Uh, we've seen a increase of by something like 300% going from about 50 youth uh, coming to our drop-in programs to close to 400 in the past year. Uh, so continuing to increase in demand. Have, uh, have your group, have the, the resource centre through the board and yourself, have you reached out to the provincial government seeking assistance? I, I, I believe you had a good program reaching to uh, mental health uh, in, in the affected area. Have you applied for any funding or grant from the provincial government? So we're not eligible for any mental health funding specifically because we aren't existing a mental health provider, but we have a number of community partners who provide mental health services uh, on site, and we have been part of supporting uh, requests uh, for increase in mental health funding uh, from the provincial government to our uh, city partners around those resources. Those are absolutely critical in need, and we recognize that it's a shared responsibility with the provincial government. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, above and beyond the uh, addition of uh, your priorities to the term of council priorities, what are other investments that uh, you're seeking immediately to, to really redress uh, some of the poverty that's, that's emerging in the city? 
Well, I think that from the coalition's perspective, these, you know, we want to uh, separate from things that uh, mitigate poverty and things that actually alleviate poverty. So things that mitigate poverty and that we're pleased to see in the budget and, and in the priorities is things like the uh, stabilization of the equity pass is, is really uh, critical and helps mitigate the impacts of poverty. Um, things that help alleviate is the investment in social housing and continuing to uh, invest, invest there. As I said, the, the supports that are provided around things uh, that allow our staff to run things like income clinics, make sure that we're uh, maximizing and leveraging the benefits that people are uh, uh, able to access and increase their ongoing income. So we're working at both a, a prov provincial and federal uh, level to advocate that, not just with the City of Ottawa. And uh, just briefly, is there other strategies that uh, the city can undertake to, to address uh, poverty reduction? I know that there was uh, recently a panel discussion that was held by uh, the Ottawa Food Bank concerning the uh, creation of a uh, poverty reduction strategy, municipal poverty reduction strategy for the city. Do you think that that would be a, a, a proper undertaking uh, for this municipality? Thank you, Councillor. Absolutely. I think uh, having a formal plan that looks at multiple strategies, we've presented some and we think that having a formal plan that, that has concrete steps that the city is moving towards in terms of reducing poverty would be an essential step. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a motion by Councillor Luloff. Carried. Merci. Uh, and then a motion by Councillor Cloutier. Carried. Adopté. And uh, on the report is amended. Carried. Uh, our final item is the uh, 2020 draft operating and capital budget. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, do, would people like a presentation on this or would you like to go to questions? Questions? Okay. Councillor Fleury. Yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I do have two quick questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, one which is on page 54. It's the MAT tax. I've sort of uh, talked about that in another budget, but it's really well broken down here. Uh, the MAT tax revenue of 18.7 a year. Sorry, Councillor, I forgot. We do have a couple delegations. Oh, I apologize. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, Michelle, are you back uh, doing the presentation now? Okay, so uh, welcome back. Same rules, same seat. And then next after is uh, Martina Turcinovich. Is Martina here? Okay, so you'll be up uh, after uh, Michelle. Michelle, the floor is yours on the budget. Thank you very much. Um, so as I noted, as members of the Coalition of Community Health and Resource Centres, we work with the most vulnerable children, youth and families and seniors in Ottawa to support them to meet their basic needs. In recent years, we have found that these residents have more complex and urgent needs and that the number of people who access our services continues to grow. This is at a time when nonprofit social services are faced with chronic underfunding that has led many organizations to a crisis point. And when I say we're at a crisis point, we're talking about 65% of the organizations managing their services with longer waiting list. It's 44% of the organizations making difficult decisions to reduce services. It's 18% of those organizations faced with the reality of having to turn people away. We track this back to the 2011 budget when the city eliminated a non-renewal project grant and to 2012 when the city cancelled a sustainability fund. The sector is still feeling the effects of these cuts and new funding pressures are exacerbating the situation. Cuts from the provincial government and United Way in 2019 have impacted programs like homework clubs for 6 to 12 year olds and after school programs for 12 to 17 year olds. In the lower town neighborhood alone, the cuts have meant that 80 to 110 vulnerable children and youth are without programming during critical hours. We are here today, or I'm here today representing the coalition because these cuts have led to reduced staff, reduced hours, and reduced services. And this has galvanized organizations and individuals from across Ottawa to make a couple of asks of this Ottawa City Council. In a petition with over 2,000 signatures, Ottawa residents have urged City Council to invest $5 million over and above existing funding for social services in our city. The second ask is to create a 2019-2022 Council Term of Priority that includes the expansion of nonprofit social services with clear targets for strengthening those services. 
Increased funding across the system would benefit programs like Western Ottawa Community Resource Centre and an investment of half a million dollars, for example, across the system would provide services to an additional 2,689 residents accessing supports per year. For example, in our community that, that is still recovering from tornadoes and flooding in recent years, we'd be able to continue to expand those services. While the city would have to put in place a process for establishing where to spend those funds, this is one example of a return on investment. And while we are drawing attention to this issue because social services save taxpayers money, they prevent and manage health, addiction and safety issues before they turn into crisis, and this reduces the need for more costly hospital, police and paramedic response. Consider that social services like home visitation or subsidized snow removal help seniors maintain independence. And when seniors can't access key services, they may become isolated or the cost and responsibility are downloaded to their children who on average spend 3000 a year, 3300 a year to care for aging parents. This is where the indirect impact of the social services sector become more obvious. Right now, emergency services are deployed in response to issues that could have been prevented or managed by social programs. In this way, social services make good economic sense. And indeed, there are times when emergency services are best supported to respond to community incidents. The city is proposing to fund an additional 30 police officers in the 2019 budget. The thing is, is that when an officer responds to incidents in the community, such as a death by suicide or homicide, they connect the bereaved and victims to social services for ongoing support. These two sectors and the services they deliver go hand in hand, but in 2018 when the city invested $24.25 per resident for social infrastructure, a decrease of 2.6% since 2011. In the same year, the city invested $334.87 per resident for police One services, minute. an increase of 24.6% since 2011. Ottawa's nonprofit social services play a critical role in crime prevention and support to victims, but it will be difficult to keep up with referrals from the police without an increase in funding. In fact, one of my colleagues who was in one of the communities where there is an additional community policing has said that she cannot possibly accommodate all of the referrals that will come from the conversation she's having from community policing. The draft budget also includes an additional 500,000 in one-time funding to support nonprofit social services, as well as an increase to account for the cost of living. It's a start, but more investment is needed with Ottawa social services. Every person deserves affordable food, housing, and other supports needed to survive. When planning for a city with a population of more than a million, we can't let our social services crumble. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Great. Thank you. Uh, Martina Turchinovich from the Ottawa Music Industry. May I have some questions? Oh, sorry. Councillor Menard. Hi, thanks, Mayor. Sorry, I got in late there, so I appreciate coming back. Um, just on the ask itself, uh, it's, it's $5 million, uh, this year. I, is that a one-time ask? I've, I've talked with uh, some folks from, from the group a little bit, but is it, is it a one-time ask for this year that over the, the term of the rest of the term of this council, or uh, what, are you, what are you looking at? It's, it's, a, it's a $5 million increase to our base funding, so it's, it would be an ongoing, so that an increase of $5 million uh, and over the course of the term, but we want to see the uh, investment increase by five million dollars in permanent funding. I see. Okay, so to the base, you'd add five. Yes. But the expectation in terms of future years, you may not yes. necessarily have it every year. But the the base is looking at, at five. So potentially a, you know, a three year phase in or something yeah. is, is also an option there. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank that's, you. that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So um, where do you have a suggestion on where we'd find the five million? Well, uh, that's a really good uh, question, and I'm not sure where that would come from. Um, I, my question, 
you know, in terms of what we've been talking about is, is that as we've invested in other services, we've found those resources to do that. The pressure will continue to increase, for example, on police services, increasing demand for services if we're also not supporting some of the factors that, for example, keep young people uh, engaged in recreational uh, uh, programs and facilities and keep them engaged in school and support those police officers. If we don't have the support backing up of those police police officers, the pressures will continue to mount elsewhere in the system. But you're an executive director of a, a large organization, so every year you put your budget together and you have to say yes to some things and no to other things, and you have to, oops, no, it's on. Uh, you have to um, make those decisions. So my question is a serious one, because we have to make that decision. Where does the money come from? So at this stage, you know, um, you don't have a specific suggestion for us. Uh, I don't, but but we will. Uh, we can take a look and and come back to you and and uh, provide from additional suggestions within that. And I I apologize that I I don't have that suggestion for you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cavanaugh, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your presentation. And I know that you do a lot of good work um, through all the uh, centres across Ottawa. Uh, my question is, um, um, have you been uh, experiencing cuts from the provincial government? Is that part of the reason you're here? It is uh, part of the reason that that the whole the coalition as as a, a whole are here. We are all experiencing experiencing those cuts. For my organization, the the cuts have more impacted on programs and services that are not funded uh, by the city. For example, in our violence against women um, services. However, um, the uh, for others, um, cuts from the province and cuts from United Way, as I said, have have impacted on homework programs and after schools programs. Those are programs that keep kids in school. We know that keeping kids uh, engaged academically increases um, success rates in completing high school. Um, so the supports that they have been uh, cut in terms of their um, uh, other social services have uh, resulted in a reduction of, of services and pressures elsewhere that, that then flow people through programs that are funded by the city like our dropping counseling programs and crisis intake and response. Thank you very much. So you've experienced two levels of cuts. You've experienced cuts from the province and also cuts from United Way funding? That's correct. Okay. So uh, so is this $5 million asked, is it to backfill that those funds that you're losing from those two sources? Is that what you're saying? Even if we hadn't received the cuts, the increasing pressures and demands are, are increasing on our services. It, it isn't just because of the cuts. The cuts are exacerbating the pressures on, on services, but agencies are still increasing. Ourselves alone have seen a 30% uh, increase in a number of our programs. Others have reported 50% increase in demand on services that, that are just hard to bear. So you're also saying it's because of growth, the growth of the need. It is. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate um, having that information to, to understand better what the ask is all about because it's, uh, it's not just a, so you're not looking just for a one time, you're looking at continuously? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Luloff, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thanks for the coalition for all the work uh, that you do, uh, advocating uh, for people that are less fortunate than, than some of us. Um, what specific programs uh, have been cut uh, because of uh, provincial cuts uh, to your funding? Uh, that have been cut with regards to specific, to provincial cuts? Yes, correct. With, with, within that? Um, the like what are you not able to offer now because Doug Ford's government has cut. Well, what I can give you, and I and I have an example given from one of my colleagues that, uh, in terms of the funding impact across the board, I don't have it specifically whether it's provincial or United Way, but for example, Lower Town Community Resource Centre is no longer able to offer weekend and evening activities uh, for basketball, for example, for 12 to 17 year olds. So then they are spending more time hanging out in the neighbourhood and and at risk for getting in trouble. Um, they're also no longer able to provide uh, the swordfish 
outreach swimming program to 80 children and youth who used to attend. And not only is this 80 children and youth who used to attend making them more vulnerable to drowning, but it also reduces the stock of lifeguards in Ottawa because the program also had a lifeguard training in pro um, program, which also impacts employee. It's a viable employment opportunity for youth in lower income neighborhoods. Well, yeah, that, and we have yeah. a lifeguard shortage right now in the city. And a lifeguard Ottawa. shortage and all of that. So those are the, that's a very small but tangible and that seems to have, it's just, when you think it's just a basketball program or just a swimming program, it has huge impacts in terms of youth engagement, youth employment, and uh, life expectancy. So we understand how it impacts us because those cuts are downloaded upon, you know, municipal taxpayers in Ottawa and then we have to pick up the slack. Um, what, um, how does it affect the community? Well, I think that the the community as a whole, you know, when when those pressures happen and things start happening, you start seeing an increase in vandalism. So then people, you know, if people aren't, if kids don't have things to do, then they find things to entertain themselves, as an example. And it's not just kids, you know, for example, who are doing vandalism. But then you have then people spending out to have to spend time and money to do repairs, and then the neighborhood starts to look more run down, and then people feel that it's not worth that investment, and then you start to get the pressure, and you know there's lots of evidence that also shows that those small petting crimes then increase if, when people see that it's not being taken care of. So it has a spin-off and growing impact on neighborhoods and communities. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Dudas. I, I want to uh, thank you for coming here today, and I understand uh, it's, it's difficult to, to make ends meet when you know budgets are being um, well, cut and changed. I mean, at the city level, we're experiencing that as well with the province. And I, I guess I, I appreciate you coming here, but I, I'd also like to um, understand what you're doing in respect to approaching the province to see about reestating your funds and, and how you're approaching them in that respect. Thank you, and it's, and it's an important question because we recognize that this is not the responsibility of any one level of government, uh, nor uh, any one funding envelope. So it's not just the responsibility of United Way, and it's not just the responsibility of the City of Ottawa. We continue to advocate, and as part of the coalition, uh, have also made presentations and deputations when there are uh, budget uh, consultations for the provincial government. We continue to meet with our MPPs. Uh, around uh, the provincial fundings and the impact that those cuts have had in our programs. And there are many of us, particularly in our services that support newcomers, immigrants and refugees, that we also advocate at the federal level uh, because there has been impact, uh, growing demand, not necessarily cuts in the funding, but certainly growing demand on those services that is a federal responsibility. So we take those advocacy issues seriously to act on those levels as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so from uh, Martina Turchinovich from the Ottawa Music Industry Coalition. Welcome, you have uh, five minutes. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Martina Turchinovich and I'm here with Alka Sharma on behalf of the Ottawa Music Industry Coalition. So I'm here today because the Ottawa Music Industry Coalition is grateful for the generous support we've received from the city's economic development and long range planning department. And we're proud of the work that we've been able to do together to develop this critical creative industry as part of the city's economic diversification efforts. We're pleased to see that further funding to support the industry through our organization is included in this budget to the tune of 540,000 over four years. Uh, and we appreciate the city's continued support and belief in our industry and our organization to make important strides for Ottawa in terms of economic diversification, growth, and tourism. However, we would strongly encourage the city to think about whether that figure is sufficient to meet our shared goals under the current strategy and beyond. We may be a mighty organization, but we are also a small one with 2.6 FTE positions. Yet we have managed to deliver or are in the process of delivering on all of our commitments under the strategy as well as supporting the city in delivering on its own commitments, especially in the absence of a full-time music officer. The one key deliverable the city has yet to action. The music officer would play an essential role to, uh, in terms of educating the city of Ottawa about our vibrant and diverse music ecosystem and connect community members to the resources they need to grow. We've stepped up to the plate to deliver with the launch of the Confederation Line, 
animating Lansdowne Park in 2018, and providing advice and support to music businesses looking to navigate local bylaws and licensing requirements. Yet we can't continue to perform and provide miracles without adequate resources. As we come to the end of our current funding agreement in 2020 and look towards the future, we ask the city to consider increasing the resource commitment to our industry and to OMIC so that we can continue to serve as the strong, efficient, and reliable partners uh, we've proven ourselves to be at a time when resources from the province are shrinking, competition for talent is growing within our sector, and the cost of doing business in, the, in our city is on the rise. We thank you for the opportunity and we welcome any questions. Great. Thank you. Councillor Lula. I'd like to thank your organization and uh, your former um, director, uh, Nick Ives uh, Allison, for all the work that you did, uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the bylaws uh, and uh, for, for loading. Uh, having been a musician in Ottawa for, for over 10 years, I know how frustrating it is when you get a ticket for, for pulling up, or you're unloading a drum kit or an amp, and then you come downstairs and you've got a ticket on, it, on your car. Or, in the worst case scenario, someone's trying to tow you. Um, so the work that you do on behalf of our artists uh, is, is incredible. What, what have you been able to do since, um, um, since your founding uh, to support our local artists? Local artists, okay. uh, There was the launch of the Love Local Music campaign which promoted a local artist playlist as well as helped music get onto the Aunt Music playlist, which is um, when you call the city and you're put on hold, you hear local artists. Uh, we've also ran an incredibly successful artist development program for artists and artist managers. Uh, we've also completed the first round of our Ottawa Music Development Fund, which is a distribution of micro grants that went to, uh, I think, around 20 plus different recipients, different streams, different projects. That was this year. Uh, we've also done the Love Local stage on Spark Street two years in a row, which is a weekend of local musicians uh, on the Spark Street Mall. Is there anything to add? Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we're also collaborating with the City of Ottawa p to put on the uh, Capital Music Awards, which is happening in February. Well, thank you very much for all that hard work. Uh, I know that our artists really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Councillor uh, Tierney as Vice Chair of the Committee has a motion which is our road map uh, that will go through on the budget um, uh, number by number. Oops, sorry, Councillor Fleury. Yes, to staff, um, I have two of them. They're both on page 54. The first one relates to uh, the, um, the, uh, the MAT tax. So we plan uh, to generate uh, 18.7, but I'm unclear as to what what directions council has given to transfer that amount to Ottawa Tourism or which proportion. Last time you explained to me that we were keeping a portion of that and uh, transferring the other to Ottawa Tourism. So could you just give me a context of the range of that program? So the 18.7 that we anticipate raising in 2020, 18 of that will go to Ottawa Tourism. So there's an expenditure line up above uh, and under corporate common expenditures and of 18 million. So that goes to them. The remaining 750,000 stays with the city of Ottawa and you have used it in the past to do things like, oh, excuse me, to do things like the music strategy. So you have used that as part of your budget and so the increase to the, uh, and that basically represents the Airbnb portion that we've increased that for 2020 to the 750,000 from, I believe it was 500,000. And you use that as part of your budget to invest in various things. Okay, but overall it's a collection component for uh, the draw of tourism. Like, I, I'm, I guess I'm questioning what's the policy behind, uh, I thought it was a direct transfer to auto tourism, but now that we're collecting it, some parts, we what is are that? collecting the Airbnb part uh, because the Hoteliers Association uh, they collect their own portion and we remit it or they remit it directly to Ottawa Tourism through us to Ottawa Tourism and that's what the uh, hotel tax was put in for to begin with. Yeah. It was to it was all supposed to go as a base. Whatever you earned was supposed to go to support tourism. So then we tacked on Airbnb and that was not part of that. So we kept that as part of what the city revenues to support a number of other initiatives that the city wanted to take sort of along the same veins as what Ottawa Tourism does. 
Okay, and just from a, a policy approval, I'm comfortable with the layout currently, but if we were to change the ratios, we'd have to come back to council? Uh, you would have to have discussions with the, uh, uh, with the hoteliers to begin with because it, the money obviously is being raised by them and they're very supportive of this arrangement as it is right now. They're not concerned about the Airbnb because it doesn't come from them. But yes, if you wanted to change that arrangement, it would take uh, um, um, just discussions with them and coming forward with uh, a change to the policy. Thank you. And then my final question is, uh, it's the condensed portion on page 54 on the large uh, document for FET codes, page 101, is it relates to the red light cameras. So we're, 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 trying, we're going to generate close to $12 million. Can you just, again, explain the legal framework around that? Because I, I think there's limitations as to where council can spend that amount, or if not, could you correct me? There are no legal limitations as far as I know, and I look at uh, actually the lawyer <laughs> that, as to where that can be spent. What you have done last year and what you are doing um, actually 2019 and what you're doing in 2020 is in order to help with the police with their desire to uh, increase their, their um, uh, workforce. We are transferring funds raised through red light camera to the police force. So last year and this year the increase goes to uh, the police force and then in anything after that come, would come to the city. So it's part of your general revenues. It goes in to support all of the other work you, you're doing primarily. I would say it's probably matched very closely to what the investment we're making in, in, the, um, in Phil Landry's area with all of the safer road uh, initiatives. I didn't hear that. With the uh, match to what Phil Landry's doing in his area around the safer roads initiatives. Okay. Thank you. For, thank you for clarifying. Councilor Hubley, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Mine is a direction to staff, if I could please, as part of the budget piece. Uh, one of our uh, strategic initiatives from the last term of council was the innovation program to support new and small businesses in our city. The uh, program was very successful and attracted interest uh, from large corporate partners to help us expand the program as well. So uh, I'm wondering if the, uh, as part of the, uh, this budget that um, staff could come back to us and uh, give us an update on what the plan is going forward with this program. And so would that be fair to take as a direction? Hey, Mr. Willis. Yes, Mr. Mayor, staff can take that direction. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Menard, please. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. I have a few inquiries just about the, the budget, just mostly just questions. Um, the, uh, on page 16, the, the O-Train construction uh, line item of the FEDCO budget, um, we're estimating still expenditures of um, 677000 and that's gone down from last year, which makes sense. Are those allocated to a certain uh, particular priority or, or what, what, how, much, how much more expenditures are we going to have on the initial O-Train construction? Uh, these are the funds to support the office, so there is still some residual work that's required because until the project is closed out, uh, there is still uh, some semblance of an office there. So that's for the, uh, the few people that we have in the O-Train construction office. Okay, so that will continue to decline over time? Yes, it would. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, this looks like a good news item, but under the legislative services item, it's actually page 5, um, we have a million, $1.1 million reduction under the, uh, I guess it's um, legislative services. It, it looks like this has been steadily reducing from our actuals in 2018 of 16 million. So just, can you give me more information about that? Does that have to do with like the, the, the clerk and solicitor's role changing or? No, that okay. is simply the fact that in 2019 you had a by-election. So we had included half a million dollars okay. for that. So that's being removed. And then also in 2019, because you had an election in 2018, there's residual work that is, was done related to the election in 2019. And that 730,000 is also being removed. That is the reduction in under legislative services. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, uh, the back to the mat uh, with Kenshaw Fleury asked about the municipal accommodations tax, we have uh, a two, so a $2.1 million uh, increase from last uh, budget that's on the the revenue or that's on the expenditures side um, 
Can, is that, can you just go into more detail about what, what the change there? That's actually on the revenue and the expenditure side. Okay. It nets to zero. So uh, based on what we have been seeing and in discussions with the hoteliers, uh, we think that's a reasonable estimate of actually how much more they're going to generate in 2020. And as per our agreement, that actually goes to Ottawa Tourism. So the expenditure goes up and the revenue goes up correspondingly. Okay, we're, increase, we're anticipating that increase even with the changes uh, to uh, Airbnb potentially coming in that year. That's correct. Okay. It's been going up every year since we uh, implemented this program. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, back to your, your comment about the election requirement and legislative services. So I see that there's a, that $780,000 reduction uh, on page 61, I guess. It's the 2020 pressure. Um, so uh, anticipating that there may be other by-elections in, in that year, is that, is that going to be consistent for, for 2020 or do we anticipate some, some change to that or is that a separate, separate line item? If there's another election in 2020, uh, we'll come forward or I won't, but Mr. Uh, O'Connor will come forward and request money coming from the Tax Stabilization Reserve, which is the source of funding for all of your one-time expenditures. Okay. Councillor Fleur, you also had a question about the red light cameras. Um, so I see we're, we're adding three more FTEs specifically for, for red light cameras. It, why, why is that a need? I mean, are we just massively expanding these or what's the... What's the need for that? It's actually in the courts because, uh, or in the, uh, in the client service center because the more tickets you issue, the more people show up wanting to pay or wanting to plead. So it's actually to deal with the volume that you're increasing because we end up having to process those through the client service center. I got it. Okay. The, okay, the defense court. Okay. Um, the uh, payment in lieu of taxation, it's page 103. The PILTs, uh, tax rebates, and remissions were projected to be in a combined deficit of 5.5 of million. Um, can you go through why that is, what, what the difference is this year? It's uh, page 103, very last line item. Um, the payments in lieu of taxes have actually been decreasing through this assessment cycle. It has to do with the fact that um, the assessment values for those properties uh, dropped lower than uh, the other commercial properties, it just the, the state of the buildings that they own and so on. So we've been taking that account down. Uh, typically what we do, Councillor, is we don't do it as part of the budget because we know you have other priorities at the budget, but when we do our final tax policy report and we do all of our technical adjustments as per when you set the tax rate, Generally, it, it generates a, a few dollars, and we apply those. We get your permission to apply those to reduce the PILT account. So we haven't done it this year or in this budget, but I anticipate we'll probably be doing it again in April of 2020. Okay. Um, thank you for that. The Hydro Ottawa Dividend uh, Surplus, uh, also on page 103, um, I think we're looking at a, a net differential of, of $1.8 for 2020, so that's the anticipated. Is that the anticipated surplus we're anticipating in 2020, or or there's the difference in what we collected from last last year? That is actually what we collected this year. So okay. we get the uh, dividend for 20. Uh, 2018 in 2019, and that dividend was 1.8 million hires, higher than uh, we had budgeted for. So we have included the 20 million as per your shareholder agreement with Hydro as part of the 2020 budget. Uh, what I've seen from Hydro at this point in time doesn't lead me to believe that they will be far off that. Okay, thanks for that. And then on that same page, it looks like we're increasing the volume of, we've, we've, had, we've had more money come in from the volume of tickets issued for, by $4 million, so that's, uh, that's just interesting to note. Um, on page 104, um, we have an item called the removal of 2019 council approved items funded from the tax stabilization reserve and other miscellaneous funding adjustments. And the changes are net 2020, 2019 changes are $8 million. Can you explain what that is? 
So this is a little bit of accounting that we have to put into the budget to basically show you, because we start, show you what your budget was that you approved in uh, 2019 and what it's going to be in 2020 and all the changes that happen from one year to the next. You included in significant uh, amount of one-time money in uh, 2019 for various things. For example, you did, uh, I think it was $5 million towards investing uh, contribution for affordable housing, a whole bunch of, of one-time items. This is basically just the removal of all of those items. So it's, is it the items that didn't get, didn't, we didn't use the funding last year that we allocated? No, or what, I, I'm trying to it's just that it's, they're all in 2019. They were expensed in 2019. Oh, but now we have to remove them from the budget because they don't carry forward in to okay. 2020. So these were one-time items, basically, for that budget. Exactly. Okay. Um, be interesting to see what what those the list of those were. I don't know if you can follow up with me and just give me. We the can list. provide you with the list okay. from 2019, and there is another list for 2020 because you have, in fact, uh, added a number of one-time item, items into the 2020 budget. Okay. And on that same line, the land ambulance service is being the two million dollars. There's a two million dollar uh, expense change, I guess, just related to uh, that CPS budget. That relates to the program costs for uh, ambulance services. Ambulance services gets funded by the province based on what is in what is in their financial information return. That return includes not just the cost of the ambulance services, but the support services that the rest of the city provides in order that they can do their work. So, for example, a portion of uh, the payroll costs, a portion of their legal services costs, and a and of course depreciation on their vehicles. So when we receive the funding from the province, we give the ambulance what they need for the 50% and the rest goes to cover a portion of the program costs that uh, uh, are, are there for ambulance services. Okay, thank you for that. My last one, uh, Mayor, is just on uh, page 117. Um, it's the Confederation Line tr item. Uh, under the capital projects, and so it, it indicates our unspent cash balance is five hundred and one million dollars from the confederation line. Can you explain why you 'll note that that is an august thirty first two thousand and nineteen balance so right. we because we have to publish the book at some time we can 't keep the the numbers open, so we did a data dump on on august thirty first we paid them what we owed them in uh, September, I believe it was. So it, that's not reflected in there. So these are not your latest, okay. your latest numbers. Do you know what the latest number is? I forget what the payment was there in September. Um, well, I know it's less than that, or but I don't know what it okay. is. Uh, I'll get you the exact number. And what is that payment used for now? That, like the leftover, say it's 250 million. I can't recall what the payment was, but what, what is that now? So there's still a number of items that are, are still open with respect to that. We still have, uh, as uh, I believe you got the land uh, um, report today, so there's a number of items that are still where are, are negotiating the land values for certain properties. So there are still things that are ongoing with that project. So this, this uh, $2.1 billion is not only the construction contract, but it's also the, uh, the, uh, the office and all of the residual works that are done by, uh, uh, by the city around this light rail uh, okay. contract. Thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful information. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor uh, Tierney uh, is moving the roadmap, and we'll go one by one. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, that the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommends to Council, sitting as a committee of the whole, approve the Finance and Economic Development Committee 2020 draft operating and capital budget as follows. Number one, elected officials operating resource requirement. Gary? Gary. Go ahead. Oh, uh, the Office of the City Clerk budget as follows. One, user fees. Two, operating resource requirements. Carried. Item number three, the City Manager's Office, operating resource requirements. We better look into that. <laughs> Carried. Carried. Number four, Transportation Services budget as follows. A, rail construction program as follows. Uh, one, user fees. Two, operating resource requirements. Carried. Carried. Uh, item number five, uh, planning, infrastructure, and economic development departmental budgets as follows. A, general manager's office and budget ser support services, operating resource requirements. Uh, B, economic development and long-range planning as follows. 
uh, one, user fees, two, operating resource requirements. C, corporate real estate office as follows, one, user fees, two, operating resource requirements. Carried. Councilor El Shantiri. Mr. Mayor, we, we seen on uh, council priority list so much the Office of the Economic Development, especially for the rural strategy, and and I, I don't see any additional staff. And I'd like to ask the, gen the general manager, uh, Mr. Wallace. So we we seen it in both. Uh, you have it on uh, on the term of council priority, and also in the budget. But there's no uh, staff and or, or no additional staff and to that department. I mean, don't you agree this is the right uh, or the right time and opportunity to be able to have uh, more resources to 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 uh, explore more the rural economic development with the OP in place and and uh, master transportation plan coming after that. I mean, I'm wondering like we have all these wish lists, but we don't have support to, to move forward with it. Mr. Mayor, in setting the budget uh, for this year, we operated within Council's directions on what the budget would be, uh, the budget tax target. Uh, these are tax-funded areas. There are no additional uh, resources to add more staff, but what we do, uh, and when we file our annual work plans, the Planning Committee, ARAC, and, and all the committees we report to, we prioritize all of the Council's directions and actions and ask for your approval to priority, and we'll use the staff of the Department to service those as required, and sometimes we bring in staff who aren't necessarily assigned to rural to work on rural projects as we did with the rural Econo economic development strategy so we do we uh, do what we can with the resources mr. mayor and we ask the committees to help us prioritize what they want done in what order okay. my other question is if uh, if the rural councillor agree to to contribute from uh, from cash and lieu or another venue we have to, because I, I feel there's an opportunity for us right now to, to, to add resource to that file, because economic, that's a $1 billion economy from the rural area, so there's a lot of opportunity to grow that area and see a benefit from it. So it's a small investment, but I, I feel strongly toward we should find some resources to, to that section. Well, I think maybe if I could just uh, offer a comment. I, I, I agree with um, your assessment of the, the size of the rural economy and the potential for more. I think, as Mr. Willis has indicated, they're more than willing to sit down with members of ARAC and reprioritize things within their budget. I know that you do have some people that work on rural issues that help us every year with the Rural Expo and, um, and so on. So uh, I think I, I would suggest perhaps, you know, Mr. Willis, uh, meet uh, individually or collectively with the, the four rural councillors to uh, come up with something that can uh, satisfy your desires, councillor, and at the same time stay within the budget. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Tierney? Great. Uh, so, I'm, so on that item number five, was that carried? Carried. Great, thank you. Item number six, um, the uh, in, uh, Innovative Client Service Centre Department budget as follows. A, General Manager's Office Budget and Business Support Services, Operating Resource Requirements. B, City Solicitor, <coughs> Operating Resource Requirements. C, uh, Service Transformation, Operating Resource Requirements. D, Public Information and Media Relations, Operating Resource Requirements. E, Human Resources, Operating Resource Requirements. F, City uh, sorry, service auto as follows. One, user fees. Two, operating resource requirements. And finally, G, supply service, operating resource requirements. Carried. <clears throat> Item number seven, the financial services department budget as follows. The chief financial officer, treasurer, and business support services, operating resource requirements. B, revenue service as follows. One, user fees. Two, operating resource requirements. C, corporate finance, operating resource requirements. D, payroll, pension, and benefit <coughs> services, operating resource requirements. Carried. Carried. Item number eight, non-departmental operating resource requirements. Carried. And last but not least, item number nine, finance and economic development, de development committee capital budgets. Carried. Great. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Uh, notices a motion for consideration at a subsequent meeting. Uh, inquiries, we had Councillor Hubley already uh, give his inquiry. 
Other business? Adjournment. Carried. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Merci.